and we are live on YouTube. Welcome everyone. We're going to be moving on to health and wellness and patience and uh, the endocannabinoid system. So that's me, Peter Severi, Future Cannabis Project, and I'm going to pass it off to Christina Trout. Thank you, Peter, so much for allowing this platform to be shared by just a group of very powerful, dynamic women who are, we're all here to kind of share our varying um, perceptions of how and what the endocannabinoid system is and how it operates uh, within our bodies and sort of allows us this connection and communication with the, the world and our allies in the plant world um, towards true medicine and towards true healing. And I'm here with Sharon Montes and Jordan Pearson, Pauline Coynes, and did I pronounce that right, Pauline? Yes. And uh, Christy Thiel. So um, on that note, I'm gonna just pass it right directly um, to Jordan, because what I'd like for us to do is share a little bit of our healing journeys and um, in sort of revealing our understandings of the ECS. We'll go ahead, Jordan. Pleasure to have you. <laughs> you're, you're muted, Jordan. I saw that, sorry. My dogs were barking and I didn't want that to interrupt us. Um, hello out there in YouTube land. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I am truly joined by a distinguished group of women today. I'm honored to be, uh, to, to be joining them. So since we're kicking this off with our health journey and kind of how we got to the point we're at, mine is an interesting one in that it truly took me from being the nurse to being the patient to being the nurse again. So my medical history, um, let's, let's go back further. I've been a nurse for 20 years. I've been doing massage therapy for 15 years. And in 2010, I became very ill and I was on 13 pharmaceuticals. And I had just had my first surgery, which was a gallbladder removal. And in doing so, they found a massive tumor on my liver that they deemed inoperable. And so every day I got sicker and sicker. And so cannabis was the only thing that actually made me feel better. It wasn't these 13 pharmaceuticals that were supposed to be making me feel better. Instead, it was cannabis. And so I decided I would move to where it was legal and medically available. And so I took my journey to Colorado as a medical marijuana refugee. And within a few days of living here, I received my medical cannabis card and ended up having another surgery. And so over the next two and a half years, I had six more major surgeries, including a total abdominal hysterectomy in which they made an error and put me into renal failure. I had a, a liver resection where they removed 60% of my liver, but thankfully the liver grows back like a starfish. So um, let's see what else. So when it was time for me to go back to work, I had learned so much about cannabis and about other plants in general, because what were these other plant allies and that I could use? What other herbs were effective the way that cannabis is, was, however you wanna say that. And so um, I wondered what would happen if you applied cannabis from head to toe. The massage therapist in me wondered, you know, would I be so high that I couldn't continue to work on patients? Would the patient be so high they couldn't get off my table? And so it began as a big research experiment. I kept spreadsheets and I asked my patients the same types of questions. And I really tried to understand how the endocannabinoid system was interacting with the integumentary system. Because as a massage therapist, we work with almost every single body system when we're massaging someone. And so there was this direct effect that was taking place and I wanted to understand it more. And so uh, I started doing cannabis massage and then um, I began making all the products for my patients because I got to a point where there wasn't something on the market at that time that met my needs. And why, why just cannabis? There were all these other plants that I wanted to try working with to make this therapeutic product. And so then as the years went on, uh, I kept having massage therapists from around the world reach out to me and ask me how to do cannabis massage. 
So I created a curriculum called Cannabis Massage 101, and I launched it in 2017. I've now taught 33 states as well as New Zealand and Canada. And let's see what else. Um, I'm now a contributing writer for a couple publications, including Grassroots America Magazine. And my journey with cannabis began personally when I was 16 years old. I began consuming cannabis at a young age. It always just made me feel very balanced. And I had no understanding of the ECS at that time and that the primary purpose of our endocannabinoid system was homeostasis or balance. All I could tell you was that that's how it made me feel. And so to this day, it takes a whole lot to actually make me feel high. And it usually has to come in the form of an edible. Instead, I consume cannabis for every single type of symptom that I experience from nausea to pain. So that's my journey. And again, thank you so much for having me here today. Oh, and I just turned 40 and I'm the healthiest I've ever been in my entire life. And I've been pharmaceutical free for since 2013. So thank you. Can't hear you. Thank you, Jordan. Um, yeah, I think in interest of just getting our stories, because I now I have some questions for you. <laughs> like, what are some of your favorite plant alloys and, um, you know, just the differences between THC and CBD for use on the skin. And then, you know, your interaction with the pharmaceuticals as you kind of came off of that, uh, came into your, your healing. So I'm curious about that, but let's, uh, can we hold those questions just for a bit and go on to Pauline's story? Pauline, would you like to go next? Let me, hold on Pauline, let me unmute you. There you go. I guess I had to do it, yeah. Hi, Hi everybody. Uh, my name is Pauline Coynes and um, I'm really excited to be here with this fabulous panel of women and Peter um, <clears throat> to talk about my uh, experience, um, not only as a um, practitioner of, of alternative health medicine for the last 25 years, but my own personal uh, experience of how <clears throat> cannabis and uh, the ECS uh, has affected my healing journeys um, in, in, in my whole life, really. And it started about 24 years ago, 23 years ago, <clears throat> I was diagnosed with severe adrenal failure and um, stress kills. And that's exactly what was happening. I was going straight into Addison's disease and was told I had six months to live. And so I literally changed my my career, my life. I had three small children under the age of six. I was a single mom, hence the stress. And um, that's when I went back. That's what I went to back to school. I was there, and I went back to school, and I, I became a massage therapist. Uh, that has been uh, an intuitive, um, but I didn't practice my uh, intuitive abilities until much later. And so going back to massage school um, really solidified uh, how I feel about the, the somas, the body, and how the body actually um, regulates your mind, not the other way around. I mean, if, you know, it's your emotions that come in and that plays the ambonite system. Uh, let move forward to January of 2019. I was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer. And they, in no uncertain terms, told me that if I did not do their chemotherapy um, after my surgery, uh, that I would die in three months. And, and that was told to me numerous times throughout. Um, I did do pathic, uh, they did what's called a debulking, and they took eight organs out of me and closed me up and sent me home because they wouldn't talk to me any longer because I wouldn't do their, their chemo. And I uh, went the alternative route because of course my, my immune system was taxed from failure and then I was bitten by a tick. I was in Bell's palsy eight years ago. And so my immune system was not gonna withstand allopathic medicine. 
and <clears throat> that's when cannabis came in. Between the time I was diagnosed on the 24th of January, my fe my surgery was February 6th. I cannabis and I titrated up from a point a one to you know um, a, a four o before surgery, which was very high. I'm not a cannabis user. I really did never used it recreationally. It never never really felt good to me. Um, I do use it now, uh, mostly suppositorily, um, and that surpasses your brain and your liver. Um, hold on, someone's calling. I think we just lost her. So why don't why don't we? Uh... Sharon, you want to go? You want to go for a little bit? Happy to. So we will continue the conversation until Pauline rejoins us. So briefly, the, the, the relationship with this amazing plant, I think, is our connection. Um, and so I went into medical school with ancestors that were farmers and social workers. So there was this deep sense from the second day of medical school when I figured out what I'd committed to. Well, you know, this chemical reductionistic model to support healing. There's some limits to it, and, but went through it. And I did my training in county hospitals and regional trauma centers and ICUs. And I moonlit and did, you know, county rural hospital emergency rooms. So I learned what Western medicine does well. It keeps the physical body alive. And because my sole purpose it has to do with balance, I learned what it doesn't do so well. So the journey of integrating plant medicine to treat coronavirus, by the way, when I was in medical school and when I recognized that there were some limits to the tools they were giving me. And, you know, our ancestors knew how to use plant medicine. And this was before the 90s when everything, you know, the European stuff, when it started becoming woven in. But, you know, people would have cold symptoms. It's like, oh, by the way, this plant medicine is actually better than anything I'm learning about in medical school to help your virus and help you feel better. So finishing residency, signed up for community education class and acupressure. So ah, five elements, meridians, energy flows. And given the way I think of the world, I was like, well, this makes so much more sense. Why did you, why did I do this reductionistic quantitative stuff? And the wise part of myself said you were supposed to do that. And so the idea of you've got a person out of balance. So whether you restore balance using the story of relationships and energy flows, or whether you restore balance using chemistry and trying to manipulate chemistry. And the reality is we are both. We've got a relationship side, an awareness side of how we can be present. And we've got this, well, let's measure it. Let's see what we're doing. Let's, let's measure it so we can learn and improve. So this integration of art and science and working with people who are committed to that has been a lifelong journey. So coming to working with cannabis, moved back to Colorado in 2011 with my own health issues and had to use everything I knew. And there's Pauline. So let's do Sharon's journey and welcome Pauline's story of her journey as she's reconnecting in time, space, and voice. I think. <laughs> Did we, did we lose, uh, There's Pauline, Pauline, we can, we, we can hear you, Pauline. So do you want to, yeah. So Pauline. all right. Why, why don't we, uh, Sharon, okay. why, why don't you finish up and then okay. we'll go to Pauline. Okay. So fine. So bottom line, the journey professionally and personally has always been linked. And so, oh, wait. Um, okay, are we good? I think yeah, I'm sorry. Gonna, all right. So the journey with cannabis, particularly um, living in Colorado, there was a lot of noise and it was not clear to me how best to be of service to the people I cared for until a series of events, 2016, very complex, high sensitive patient came to me 
with this brilliant plant medicine prescription from a local dispensary. And I was like, wow, it's oral, it's topical, it's smoke, it's edible. And she was doing amazingly well and off a lot of opioids. And I, you know, that was like, oh yeah, we, we kind of knew theoretically, but to have a patient who's teaching me, it's like, yeah, this works. 2017 sent my mom for a medical card. It was a horrible experience for both of us. In 2018, I met someone who dedicated her life to bringing cannabis medicine to people. And it just like blew open my resistance. So spending six months on a medicinal hemp farm here in, in Northern Colorado, and just listening, transplanting the little girls, picking the aphids off and listening to the community that knew how to grow this. They understood this living soil. They understood how to cook with it. They understood how to share it with people they loved. So I listened to that community in service to working with the plant medicine. I then in turn interviewed 14 doctors. Um, none of them really knew anything or were curious. And so really got the, and then listening to the consumers living with this diagnosis of cancer and they're getting great results from this plant, but the fear of communicating that they'd be abandoned. And so really committed to be a bridge to help the communication between consumers and clinicians. So that's how I'm joining this conversation. And I think that then gets us back to Pauline and her diagnosis of this cancer and her commitment to doing integrative and being um, a messenger is how cannabis can really support our repair and recovery and healing. So I think, I think Pauline's back, Let even if muted. Unmute her. Thanks Sharon for that, it's beautiful. Um, yeah, and I think it's interesting you mentioned a little bit about the stigma too. So I'd like to enter that in the conversation at some point, just you know how to navigate the yeah little, little bit and letting the plant come through and true communication. Hi, yeah. Pauline. Are you here? Did you join us? It's going in and out. I I I'm getting like a every couple words. Okay, we can hear Here, you. Pa pa Pauline, let me, I'm going to kill your video. I don't know what, I don't, yeah. Uh, and that should make the audio Okay, a I can better. hear. Okay. Did we lose Pauline again? Okay, why don't, why don't we move on to. There you uh, are. Oh, there you are. All right. Hi, I'm so I have no idea what just happened, but sorry. You're sideways. Can, so can, yeah, you can, can you flip your screen 90 <laughs> degrees? Here we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think we'll try this over. <laughs> Yay. This is what and I wish I smoked and said skew a minute. Um so what do you i'm right here honey please turn yours off skip some feedback going on so i Paul, think we're we're being we're fusing we're gonna let this, we're, we're gonna let these things even out stay with us and and let's see how things even out and then christy will you go ahead and jump in and then pauline will follow um after christy with with you if that's all right with you sure okay hi everyone i i too am honored to be here and i i am a constant student uh i i'm going to feel very well informed after listening to everyone excited to hear everyone's uh, story and wisdom and expertise i am a master nutrition therapist and food has always been my medicine or my poison. And I've been on both sides of that, which is why I wanted to go more and more into healing modalities with something that we all do every day. Well, downstream at my practice, I finally decided to learn about cancer. And cancer was always really scary and tricky and something I didn't wanna to touch. 
And then finally, I learned that cancer really is a matter of prevention. There's lots of doctors healing cancer. And it's where I started learning about the endocannabinoid system. And as a nutritionist, you're always looking for the best way to reduce inflammation, especially with autoimmune conditions and chronic pain, you know, anxiety and mind issues where it's all anxiety. Anxiety is only inflammation, gut issues, et cetera. So really going as far upstream to root causes instead of just treating the pre-disease or the symptoms. So when I heard about the ECS, I was like, good Lord, where have I been? Why didn't I know about this? And I had to pivot on a dime. And I started working um, for a CBD company, a, a full spectrum hemp company, mentoring with the doctor and, and digging in. And I've been in the hemp industry, the, cannab the, can the hemp side of the cannabis industry for five years. And I've worked solely, about 80% of this time, I've worked solely with practitioners, educating them, teaching them, uh, learning from them and learning from their patients. And it's been profound. From my own personal journey, I've always been plagued by stress. I'm easily stressed. I can link every single health condition back to stress. Uh, 10 to 20 years of chronic health conditions, all because of stress and shutting down my gut and my lymph system, et cetera. So when I started taking cannabis in the form of hemp, this deep sense of anxiety that nutrition wasn't touching, exercise wasn't touching, therapies wasn't touching, started to become resilient. And I was blown away. And then of course I'm hearing everyone's stories and testimonies. And for me, stress comes down to three things. Numero uno, it's highly inflammatory. And the three ways that we can define stress, thanks to Bruce Lipton, is thoughts, traumas, and toxins. Now, those get lodged in our body. Negative thoughts can become habitual. Our body hears everything our mind says. And of course, we're totally taxed by to toxins no matter what. So when I started working with the ECS directly with uh, clients and through practitioners, I noticed the adaptative properties of the ECS. And even people who weren't eating healthy or doing anything else that I would think is pivotal to be doing as a nutritionist, they were healing. And I have been blown away day by day. And that's what keeps me here. I'm the director of education for a hemp company. And it's my heart and soul is in education, being a student, because this system, this plant, and how far we have to go, how far we've come, but how far we have to go is definitely what gets me going every single day. And then meeting everyone like you beautiful souls. <laughs> All right, take three. Pauline, you ready? Let me, uh, or can you unmute yourself? You're looking good. Let's see if you sound good too. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me? You can hear me okay? Can you speak? Somebody speak so yes, I can hear yes, you? We, yes, we can hear uh, you. Thank you, okay. You, you're here with um, me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, again, it's just, you know, energy in motion. Um, I, I, I'll try to pick up where I left off. Um, uh, diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer, January 25th, 10 days to um, get my affairs in order, literally, and uh, titrated up um, on a suppository of full spectrum cannabis that my partner Leighton Morrison and I uh, started a business with about five years ago and make our own, all of our own. Um, and, uh, and how it, it really uh, was instrumental in my healing. Um, you know, the, 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 the part that 
that was the hardest for me going into that was um, the paradigm of, of cancer, especially the one that I was diagnosed with, hasn't changed in over 50 years. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, Sharon mentioned, um, you know, how we are, we are as patients, we're fear mongered. I mean, I was, we family was fear mongered into saying, you know, if you don't do this, you were going to die. And that's what they told me. Those were their words. And I was just like, you don't know me. <laughs> you have no idea who I am as a person, how I feel, what my cells are doing and what I'm using. And so, um, um, one of the tests that I did, because uh, I did all of my testing up front, I, I personalized my medicine. I became my own best advocate. And one of the tests I did was called an RGCC test, a genetic testing sent to Greece. And I sent in uh, my, my cannabis products that I was using. And I have proof now <laughs> that, that, that the cannabis that I use, this full spectrum product, kills cancers, it's called apoptosis, 13%, which is a huge amount in, in, a, in a plant. And, you know, just, uh, just to jump forward again is, um, you know, the, the Western medical community doesn't know what to do with me. <laughs> they just, they look at me, literally, I, I had my last PET scan uh, uh, a week ago last Friday. And I was at City, which is one of the best hospitals in California. And my, my hematologist oncologist just shook his head and said, I don't understand why you are doing so well. You should be dead. I mean, these are his words. And then he called me the next day from, from reading my PET scan and said, I just spoke with the tumor board. We are all in agreement. You're an anomaly. You're a miracle patient. You should not be alive please come back in three months. We are going to keep, because the thing I asked him when I went into, into the meeting with him for my first appointment, he says, you look, he said, what do you want from me? <laughs> and I said, please don't throw me out of your practice. Because as Sharon said, this is what happens. We get so frustrated as patients that we just don't go back. But, but I'm writing a book about this experience and my, my, my experiences with, with life and death. And the reason why I'm staying in the medical field in the Western medical field is number one, they did surgery and they saved my life in that way. Number two, in order to bridge the gap between Eastern and Western medicine, and, and really integrate all of this together, including spirituality, that's, that's the key to, to you know, mind, body, soul healing. It's not about just like Peter said, I believe yesterday, it's not about coming down from the top hierarchy and taking and thinking it's all gonna be better. We have to take charge of our own healing. We are our best, we are our best clinicians. We, you and me in your own bodies, and so somatically get to know, you know, teach, let's teach each other how to get to know these, these systems and, and learn as a group and as a unit, because we have to be a community and, and to advocate for all of this in order for us mental. Yeah. So I'm still here. <laughs> Happily. That's beautiful. You have so much, I mean, you have, you have a story to tell and that's what it's so beautiful. Like, I feel like, like I can be right here, like shouting from the rooftops and saying, there's really great news out there because like, I, you know, to think that every single like uh, ailment has its cause in stress and that stress is largely made up of the stories that we tell ourselves and not only the stories that we tell ourselves, but the stories we tell each other. So our witnessing is so important and also our storytelling and Oh, like I'm crazy, got chills right now. <laughs> like oh, Jordan yesterday, but I I was kind of trying to come at this from a different approach today, and because uh, I do want to link it to the soil and, and just the way that I'm experiencing it, which is just magical. And so I I thought, okay, I'm going to do a random opening of a book. I'm reading this 13 original um, clan mothers right now, profound book. But anyway, I open it up to storyteller. And, and it's talking about sort of these archetypes of women and how we have this responsibility to share our stories and our wisdoms right now. 
And so it's talking about oral traditions, storytellers telling her story and saying, and basically relating it back to the creatures that we share this place with, the, the, uh, the, the plant and um, the animal kingdom as our teachers. And uh, that, that it's their medicine that gets passed on through the stories that we tell. So really it is about our relationship to the natural world and that those are the most profound stories that we could tell. Um, and so if like my understanding of the ECS has come kind of like, I have this resistance to the, to the charts and all that. So I've had to like really learn about it through my own body and my own trial and error. Um, and I kind of see that it might be like the main pathway through which we receive communication from the planet from the plant world. And so that it's a very much a direct relationship that's very much um, embedded in time and place and that it's mutable and that it changes because we are part of nature. We're in relationship with the plants around us and we're receiving through our receptors and through the development of our ECS, which changes over time. We're receiving the messages from the plants around us because they're suffering from the same conditions that we are. And that's why you can find your medicine where you're at. So, and just, I'm a natural farmer. I've been practicing that with Chris Trump and really the beauty of natural farming to me is how it allows um, a practitioner to come into a direct communication with the microbial life in the soils and how that microbial life is their microbiome, the same one that we have within our, our, our systems and that these systems are doing a crosstalk all the time. So. Literally the ECS I do see as a kind of a bridge between us and a very much a communication pathway for the plant world. So saying that and under, oh, also this is crazy. This was a fact like uh, our microbiome. So, so we have to reach, we have to, okay, a couple things if you guys don't mind. We have to change a couple things like um, the understanding that we're more than, that, that we are the sum of our parts and more. Like, so our microbiome makes up only about three to four pounds of who we are, and yet it makes up 99.9% .9 of our genetic diversity. So we are being informed by the microbial life in our systems. And um, it is about diversity and the greater diversity, the greater the balance. And so the ECS is constantly helping us to balance with things, right? And as we structure, come into harmony, that's when we have the greatest diversity of microorganisms expressing themselves through us in true health, right? So. Yes. <laughs> Christy, you want to jump in. <laughs> I wanted to, to um, reinforce how, how important you were saying, like the fear and the stress is too, because we believe our own stories. Most of them are false belief systems and fear literally is false evidence appearing real. And anxiety is the most contagious of all human conditions and plants listen to us, they hear us. And so we're affecting the planet with our imbalances and our illnesses. And we work together in that symbiotic relationship like you were just so beautifully explaining the crosstalk between humans. And just like you were saying, everything breaks down to information. Sawyer Jay speaks about this so much and we're always putting information into our cells. Are your cells well? Or are they stressed? Or are they toxic? Have they been traumatized? And Dr. Sharon's an expert on uh, cell, cell damage and the polyvagal theory, which I think is fascinating. But we've got to get this harm reduction center. That's my favorite way to explain the ECS. It only kicks in when we need it. It literally reduces harm. It has a hierarchy that it works on. And once we get ourselves out of harm and we can stop running, fighting, fleeing, et cetera, et cetera, being frozen, then we really have to pay attention to what information we're putting in there. And again, if we start from the top down, that ECS really needs to be banging on all cylinders. You got me going. Sorry. I know, that was so good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and I'm, I'm also just sort of interested in this modality where like, it is about the stories we tell and it is about like the, the, the real time, real life kind of um, relationships that we as health practitioners and healers and women have in this world. So Pauline, I'd love to hear more from you too concerning like, 
And also some of these communications are nonverbal, right? And so it does matter, like those kinds of signaling pathways are happening through this strata where like, it's not just the plant, but it's the person who's growing the plant. It's the person who's making the medicine. It's the person who's imbibing. And so Pauline, I'd love it if you would speak to that kind of uh, dynamic. Uh, you're, you're muted, Pauline. Okay, so uh, sure. One of, one of the things that, that happened when I was first diagnosed, being an um, energetic worker for, for half a century or 25 years, was um, trans something called transference. And it's real. And it's what you were talking about, Tina, because you know, energetically, we're, we're constantly um, giving and taking from each other. You know, you sit on a plane, a train, you know, get in a car with somebody and you just want to move all the way down to the other end of the train track and you don't know why. And it's really because you're feeling their energy. So as a practitioner, um, when we are working with people, um, you know, we, we should guard ourselves. And what happened was when I, when, when we started our, um, our, our cannabis business, I, I ended up getting uh, so many cancer patients. I mean, I literally, my whole practice shifted almost overnight. And so I was dealing with, um, you know, anywhere from stage one to, to people going into hospice and, and <clears throat> I, I wasn't guarding myself. And so when I was told that, of this diagnosis, the first thing that came to me was this isn't mine. 80% of this isn't, it's just not mine. Um, I, I will take credit for the 20% because of my lifestyle and, and especially emotions. Emotions play a huge part of why you get sick and how, and how it, how it sits in your body. You know, there's a wonderful book by Carolyn Mace, um, you know, about, you know, where, where emotions lie in your body and, and, you know, what happened to you. So for instance, you know, if you have breast cancer, think about, you know, something that has to do with your mom, if it's on the left side, it's by your heart. It, you know, it could be a, a real serious grief issue. If you have, for instance, ovarian cancer, were you abused at any time in your life physically? Right. So these are things that we have to think of with any sickness, how it lies and where it lies in our body. And so the interesting thing uh, I'll just on briefly was when I told my surgeon <laughs> that I took on this cancer, of course, he looked at me, rolled his eyes, thought I was a complete whack job. And uh, eight months later, six months later, when I went back for my my checkup, my scar was completely healed I think that it was from the cannabis but he looked at me and said remember when you told me you took this cancer on and I said yes and he said I believe you can you help I don't want to take my patient's cancer on and so he did this 180 degree and I hugged him I literally hugged this man this MD who you know was in the beginning was just so against everything I was doing I told him I loved him um, that's a story that needs to be told. And that's, that's what doctors need to hear because I think doctors feel and Dr. Sharon, maybe you can talk about this is that, you know, you're told to, you have to, you have to sit in your box because if you don't, and if you go too far out of it, correct me if I'm wrong, then you can, you'll be slapped on your, on the hand or you may even lose your license. And so that's a whole nother talk. I mean, we can talk about that forever that's experience with the transference and the same thing with the plants coming into us you know when we have our medicine made we know where it's made in northern california we love the people who make it they pray over it for us i know the woman who's making it when i get it i pray and do ceremony over it when i give it clients my patients they pray i teach them how to pray and and you know because i mean i say Thank you for your healing 150 times a day. That's how many pills I put in my mouth a day of herbs. And so I'm in this gratefulness stage space, you know, all that time during the day. And, and there's something to be said for that in, in your healing process. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. 
and uh, also reminding us to just stay present with you know the the action of appreciation you know that it's a bountiful existence um if we take the time to sh smell the flowers and smoke a few of them <laughs> <laughs> and and do some other things like suppositories so i'm hoping you get into that because i would like to explore modalities of how we are um imbibing this medicine maybe jordan uh session over there maybe you can help us understand how this is getting transferred through the skin that blows my mind sure um i'd love to <laughs> so i have as i mentioned a nurse for a long time been doing massage for a long time and i've used a lot of different types of products uh over the years on my clientele and when I started to use cannabis, something very different happened. Um, I couldn't necessarily explain what I was experiencing underneath my fingertips, but the patients kept giving me the same feedback over and over and over again. And I was like, okay, this has never happened with anything I've ever used before. So there's obviously something that's happening between the layers of the skin and these products. And so, I did it for several years and still was kind of operating on my own theory. And then I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Raphael Mishalem. And he gave this incredible two and a half hour lecture. And at the end of it, he gave everyone in the room, there were 500 people there, the opportunity to either ask a question or pose for a photo. And so the picture is of the back of my head because how many times do you get to meet the godfather of the endocannabinoid system and get to ask him a question? And so it's giving me goosebumps as I'm talking about. It. So, um, so I said, you know, as fast as I could, hi, my name is Jordan Person and I'm a nurse and a massage therapist. And, and, uh, and he said, I, I said, I do cannabis massage. And he said, you do what? And I said, I, I do cannabis massage. And he said, you know, I don't understand. And I said, well, I, I rub topicals on people and I use kind of my nursing knowledge to educate them why it's beneficial based upon what I've seen. I said, here's my question. Am I activating both CB1 and CB2 receptors? And he said, no, CB1 only. And I said, but why if both cell or both receptors are present within the cells, and he said, because CB2 only comes in times of trauma. So I said, well, wait a minute. If CB2 comes in times of trauma and as a massage therapist, I'm performing micro traumas to patient's skin with my elbow, aren't I then encouraging that secondary process to occur? And he looked at me and he said, nobody knows this. You are a research scientist now. And everyone that you teach and everyone that you touch is part of your research because you right now know more than anyone on this. And I literally, he told me to go forth, you know, he told me to teach as many people as I could. And I, cause I told him I had just written a curriculum and I was about to teach for the first time in two weeks. And I wanted this information to be right. And so uh, it changed my life because it made me realize in that moment that I was on the right track, that everything that I was feeling under my fingertips, that my, that my staff was feeling, that my students were experiencing, because part of my curriculum, if they take the class in person, is to experience the, different plant, the difference that plant medicine makes. So they receive a massage and they give a massage. Everyone partners off so that they feel what's happening underneath their skin, as well as they feel what's happening is they lay there on the table, the patient themselves. And so I have a couple slides. I just wanna show you um, the, the skin. The skin is very similar in, in like thinking of the layers of the soil, right? So when, I don't know why that's so blurry. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Um, so there are so many layers to our integumentary system. And we don't think about that. We think about our dermis and maybe our epidermis sometimes. We don't thinking about all these other things that are happening without us having to do anything. It, we're, and it, it's our protection from everything, right? 
Well, what's not listed on this slide is the CB1 and CB2 receptors that are a part of every single one of these layers, not just the layers, but every single type of cell. And so next slide, please. So this is something that I teach um, in Cannabis Massage 101. So when we're trying to understand why topicals are effective for our bodies, it's because these receptors have one goal. That goal is homeostasis, balance. So when we see a patient with eczema or psoriasis or any type of dermatitis or pruritus, any itis, right? Any inflammation of, any type of inflammation can be calmed when the endocannabinoid system is activated. When you have the lock and key mechanism and the activation takes place. So the reason topicals are effective is because in a number of skin cells, your epidermal keratinocytes, your cutaneous nerve and nerve fibers, your sebaceous cells, your myoepithelial cells of the eccrine sweat glands, the sweat gland ducts, the mast cells, the macrophages, it's all of them. And, and what does it do? The endocannabinoid system and certain associated signaling pathways regulate the balance. That's what eczema is. That's what psoriasis is. It's an imbalance. And often it can be treated by diet. Often it can be treated by a lot of things, but generally all of those things equal inflammation. And as Christy continues to educate and, and school us all, inflammation is the killer of everything. So together, these systems play a role in cutaneous homeostasis or balance of the skin. So that's why it's effective. And so the next few slides uh, I also use um, in my classes, this is a total knee replacement. So the, the picture on the left is one week post-operative. The picture in the middle is eight weeks post-operative. And the picture on the right is 16 weeks post-op. Yes, she did do physical therapy, but that's with a topical. That's it. That's not Neosporin. I haven't used Neosporin since I started my company and started making my products. I don't use any products. My friends all joke my salve is, is like their Windex because you, whatever, it, it works on everything there is. Um, and the next one, the next picture, this was a total jaw dropper for me because as a massage therapist, you don't ever, you're never exposed to a patient that's going to have frostbite. Coming from Florida, where I'm originally from, we would never even hear of such a thing. Here in Colorado, this was a patient that got superficial frostbite on the surface of her skin from one of those cold packs. She didn't take it off, fell asleep with it on, and it burnt her skin. And so this picture is actually only eight days apart. The top one, obviously, is the day she presented to me, which was three or four days uh, post-injury. And then the bottom picture is eight days later. And then the final picture is actually me. Uh, this is my, my clavicle. I broke in three places. It shattered uh, walking my boyfriend's dog, actually. It was a total freak accident. I flipped over uh, like somersault style and uh, just shattered the thing. I had the hardware removed on 12, 16, 19. And this scar now cut twice even looks better than the photo here, which is like crazy because it's now been cut two times. But this picture was roughly the top picture was four or five days post-op. Second picture down was mm, maybe two weeks post-op when the, the stereo strips had started to fall off. And then the last picture is about six weeks post-op. I went in for my six week post-op appointment and my surgeon was like, what, what happened? What, what have you been doing? What, how, how are you that healed? And he had people come in and look at my shoulder and I said, it's cannabis. And he was like, you can't say that in here. And I said, yes, I can. I am a medical professional. I have been a medical cannabis patient for 10 years and I can, you can get rid of the slides now. Um, you can absolutely say, I can absolutely say that in this office, like I, you are a doctor that needs to understand. I did this with topicals. So uh, yeah, that's kind of how I 
try to get people to understand the endocannabinoid system and its uh, capabilities are through our skin. So I think that I answered your question, <laughs> Tina. That's, that's beautiful. Well, it's crazy because I, all right, so I, I hadn't had a CBD, sorry. Sharon, I, I just okay. Go ahead. really, really want to emphasize the power of topicals. So as a medical professional who loves whole plant medicine, but at the same time has kind of a preference for getting things inside, because I know the importance of the gut and whatever, I have been amazed. And if we think about our skin as the largest organism for both digesting and for detoxing, to deliver something via this mechanism, it's kind, it's gentle, it allows it to go in. And if we think about our fascia, that white fibrousy stuff that you know lines the channels as the network that carries light and communication. So yes, we can speak reductionistically about CB1s and CB2s. The reality is this is an access to deeper tissue. And so adding topicals. And so I just wanna honor what you're doing, Jordan, because you're making this accessible. You're making it accessible to people regardless of tinctures and smoking. And so I'm just really impressed and grateful because I've had to do this learning with my patients. And so if I knew that you were about to learn from, I was like, it's like, yeah, I want your products and I want to be able to share them with people because this is important <laughs> and this message is important about how, because the scientist in me, when I see someone putting a topical and deep joint paint going away, it's like, oh, but yeah, let's look at how all of our cells, our, our DNA receptors, our mitochondria, we, we are made to interact with these chemicals regardless. Absolutely. So anyway, I just want to, I just want to emphasize what I just heard because it's exciting. So back to you, Christina. You. And actually Thank the other you. thing, and I don't know where you're going to go, Christina, I still would love to hear because of your passion for living soil. And I think those of us who grow things know that stewardship of the land is the same as stewardship of our body. And so that to me is part of the message you bring and your thousands of hours of how to create living soil and the messages. So anyway, I'll let you do the questions you've got, but I also, I want to hear again, because I just met you a few months ago and I'm so impressed with what you do with natural farming and that message. So anyway, it's about stewardship and the, the choices we make every day. So I'll be quiet. No, I love it. And I, I hope that you will continue very shortly after I praise Jordan on my experience of, of, of my first uh, uh, massage with her product uh, at one of her bliss events in Denver. And um, the, the experience of it was so mind blowing. It's like, I, <laughs> I've naturally had episodes during my life where I have a kind of a like I don't can't tell where I end and the world begins kind of a thing but to have the the, the ability for Priscilla an amazing practitioner like just penetrate my very body like with 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 through the seat through the receptors like it was it was a transference and a communication that was unparalleled and I left that table and I literally had to go outside and isolate myself because it was such a profound experience that I couldn't get back in my body like it was crazy healing I love that you that you mentioned that that she penetrated the mind body connection because that's actually something that I teach my students is as a massage therapist, as a healer, as a light worker, there's already this very major influence of transference. It's something that happens no matter you whether you're ready for it or not. And something that has become almost overwhelming at times is that the impact of transference has multiplied with magnitude um, to where people are having full-blown breakthroughs on our tables. Things that are, are coming out of them, both psychologically as well as physically, is, it's unreal. And I, it, it, it's happened so much 
that I've had to actually put it into the curriculum because there's in school, we're not taught about transference, but it's something that's very real. And there's people out there that are energy vampires. And if you aren't ready for things like that and you walk into a space, they will take everything from you. And when you're using cannabis as a medium, they will truly take everything from you if you're not ready for that. And so I'm happy that you mentioned the transference part because it's definitely something we deal with um, in my profession. But thank you for the praise in general. Um, I'm The products themselves are when I realize that I myself can't touch everyone, mm -hmm. like how can I get to everyone? And so my salve in particular is an extension of who I am. It's, it's every bit of my heart and soul. It took me years to develop. I gave people hives several times. Um, trying to, you know, get the herb count right and everything. And it was a journey itself. And so I want all of you to have it on the panel. You'll, you'll send me your addresses in our email. And for those of you that are local, you'll have to come to Bliss sometime. Oh and my God, it's one of the best events out there. <laughs> it's pretty it's fun, October. Oh, or exciting. September. So anyways. Cool. Now, it's, there's kind of a lingering question that will help bridge a conversation back to Sharon, uh, Dr. Sharon, that has to do with these traumas, okay? So is there a chance that, okay, so in the plant world, uh, a plant will experience a stress and then it takes about a week recovery time. But if it's given that time, it will recover fully and continue on and having learned something from the event. So thus kind of redefining what trauma means. And when you were talking about the skin as a receptor and how these were small micro traumas, I'm almost thinking that if like, there's so much information that's being, being given through that give and take back and forth trauma, non-trauma that it almost needs a new language. So like, like, I don't know, I'm just looking for a way to unravel the dichotomy of trauma so that we can, you know, kind of chart forward in a healing modality. But anyway, that's, that's all I have to say, Sharon, you take it, take it from there. Um, so uh, yeah, I do. Having done my medical training in a regional trauma center, I've got a lot to say of what I've learned. But the, the, the question is, I know that Christy Thiel has certain time limits. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to talk about the, the cell danger response and I'm happy to talk about, it's a physical thing. It's not a mental intellectual thing. We can't think our way out of trauma. But um, I guess what I'm wondering about, Christy, what are your time constraints in this conversation? What are you, where? I want to listen to what you have to say. I've got about 30 more minutes. This is okay. a lot. Okay, so I think I'll reduce it to 10. So the idea, the overview, but basically the idea is as living organisms, life happens. And trauma isn't an external event. It's how we process it. So to use the analogy, and I've got lots of stories we can tell about it, but let's just pretend that um, stress is, I think, trauma, toxins, and what were your other T? Trauma. Oh, never mind. Stress is trauma, toxins, and thoughts. Thoughts. Okay. So we got a little mindset stuff, the story we tell about it. We've got the toxins. They can be chemical. They can be energetic, like EMF. They can be bio, you know, those weird, weird bio toxin infections, the limes and the viruses, and then physical. Okay. So verbal. So the reality is these messages get trapped in our body. And so there's two ways of thinking about this. And this is what we were talking about, Christy, is the cell danger response. So, it, you know, we've used this word transference. And to me, the deal is we are all one part of some big energetic soup. This illusion, we are all neurons, neurons in a cosmic brain. And if we look at the trauma research, your nervous system and my nervous system are all part of one big nervous system. But back to cell danger response. There's a brilliant guy who wrote about this eight years ago. And I like took his article and I couldn't grok it. I couldn't, it was only last fall that someone helped interpret it. When we experience trauma, whether it's thoughts, mindset, toxins, whatever, um, our cells change. Our cell membranes, they change their structure. 
Our mitochondria changes how it produces energy. Our DNA changes the messages because that little cell, when it experiences stress, it says, I don't want my neighbors to experience stress. So it stops communicating with the other cells. It goes into this little, I will protect myself and I will protect my neighbors. And so there's a process of healing and it's a physical process. It's a chemical process. It's an energetic process. It's a structural to emerge from the cell danger response one cell at a time. And that's where the endocannabinoid system which promotes communication and signaling between cells and within the cells is super, super important. The other thing that we talk about, so we talk about our brain. So many of us know we've got a reptile brain. That's what keeps our heart going. That's what keeps our blood pressure. That's what keeps us breathing. That's the instinctual quote unquote reptile. Am I alive or am I dead? Okay. We then have a mammal brain in the, in the middle of our brain. It's like, am I happy bunny? Is it safe to play? Or is there a little danger? Do I need to attack? Do I need to run? And then we've got the intellectual thinking brain that can look at the stars and count them and imagine and say, wow, I'm part of this. And these parts of our nervous system developed in our growth as human beings. Now woven into that is our spinal cord. And so same deal. In medical school, I was taught, you've got the parasympathetic that relaxes, we've got the sympathetic that's activating. There's this brilliant, brilliant researcher by the name of Porges, who actually tied um, the anatomy that I saw and never questioned. Our nervous system comes out in three things. We've got nervous system, this vagal nerve stuff at the head, We've got the sympathetic stuff in the, in the chest, so that's heart and lungs. And then we've got another part of the vagus nerve in our stomach, okay? So the reality is in the same way we've got these layers in our brain, we've got these ladder of nervous system response in our spinal cord. And so the idea is when I feel safe, I'm gonna socialize. I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna look you in the eyes. I'm going to speak. So there's this social engagement system and that one, and I can work to escape stress using my social skills. Down the ladder of the nervous system, if my socializing, I'm still not feeling safe, I'm either going to run or I'm going to attack. I got my sympathetic thing on. If being social, listening, talking, isn't getting me where I want and attacking or running isn't getting me where I want, I'm now in a gut level response. And this is a physical mammal thing. We can't think our way out of this physiologic way that we're wired. But if I'm in my gut level response, I'm either gonna numb out and I'm gonna dissociate or I'm gonna freeze. Cause basically I'm, I'm, I'm gonna die. You know, it's not that I can be social. I can't find safety, I'm gonna die. And so in terms of helping people rewire their nervous system, there's some things. And so the goal isn't to talk, this is where art and music and creativity and creating safe environments. This is where cannabis informed trauma therapy. So, okay, fine, let's give someone this chemical which allows them to be present in whatever stress they lived and allows them to reprocess and bring it to another level. So at the cellular level, at the nervous system level, let's help people rewire their nervous system. So that, because having done this integrative alternative stuff for like 30 years and having worked in clinics where people got thousands of dollars of supplements a day, I'm like, if we can get people feeling safe in their own body, then everything works better. I don't care if it's the probiotics or prescription medicine, everything works better when we experience safety within our own skin. So that's Sharon's take on trauma. Wow. Hey, will you share some of those slides? 
we go through a little bit of that? Are you ready? For oh, that? well, the slides were just from my academic life. So I'm happy to just kind of, but because this is how I empower people. So having done this, you know, I was in it when it was alternative and complementary, then integrative. So whatever we call it. So transition is I, for 30 years, have been recruiting my patients to educate their doctors. And so this is part, <laughs> this is how we do change at the grassroots level uh, in academics. It's like, okay. So um, what I'll do, I guess, Peter, if you want to, I'm just going to share three slides that came from my chapter of being teaching in medical school environments. Does that work? Okay. So I taught in the 90s when evidence-based medicine was just coming. And so having a career in academics where I had to teach medical schools and residents, um, we were taught to value certain kinds of evidence. You know, if it was studies of studies and very condensed. And the reality is as a primary care provider who spent most of my waking hours listening to people, doing physical exams, developing a sense of who I was and how I served in one-on-one, -on -one. the uh, how do I reconcile this evidence being more meaningful than the evidence I'm getting um, from my clinical experience. So Peter, if you'd go to the next phase, the next slide. So one of the ways, and we have to give, I don't know who Alice is, but I found this on the internet and I love it. So if we think about evidence as being crumbs of information, the reality is I live at that bottom level where I'm listening to stories, where I'm talking with people who know this, when I'm learning about how cannabis has been used for thousands of years, what is the cultural way? What is the wisdom? And I come to this because same thing for Ayurvedic medicine, same thing for or Asian medicine. There's these wisdom traditions of using plants in certain ways that existed thousands of years before there were scientific randomized controlled studies. So honoring the wisdom. And the reality is when it comes to cannabis, we actually do have systematic reviews and meta-analysis, but for many of the people I'm caring for, those are the patient populations, it doesn't exist. So let's be happy and let's share and learn as a community in these, the share our, you know, digest in just the sweetness of all of the crumbs of information. So next slide, Peter. So the other way of thinking about this is sometimes doctors who are trained and encouraged to think and to value quantifiable published data lose perspective of what evidence-based healthcare really is. So fine, we like published data. It makes it easy to share information. And we also have to recognize that for the people we're caring for, using the modalities we're caring. So I was medical director of an integrative medicine clinic. And so we were using acupuncture, we were using energy healing, we were using everything that served to create a healing environment. There was no science about combining this stuff, except the clinical experience of listening. I mean, that's what we're supposed to do is listen. So when I'm working with people, okay, so fine. I like published data. I can get geeky. <laughs> so can Christina. Um, and the other thing is the provider experience. So I've been looking at genomic SNPs information since 2002 when I started caring for two, you know, children labeled on that autism spectrum. And so I know that genetic variability is going to influence everything. I know that the lifestyle that people have lived is going to influence everything. So when that patient came to me with, you know, a cannabis prescription that had all these modalities, I was like, cool. Another provider not familiar with plant medicine could have been freaked out. It's like, what do I do with this? Then there's the patient preference. They are living in the body. They've got the spirit. They've got their missions. So when we create evidence-informed healthcare, this is the original stool. These are the pieces of the information that create a whole. And that's why it's personalized. And that's why it's unique. And so holding this 
as, you know, for my peers and for the people I work with, it's like, look, it, it, we need all of it to create. So don't know if that serves, but that's the idea. That's gorgeous. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, Christy, is there something you'd like to Wow. And I'm just south of you a little bit. What? She got thunder there. I can see. Anyway. Right here. Oh yeah. my god. <laughs> You're in Colorado right now? What what just happened? I got a huge um lightning strike just behind my house. <laughs> oh, I have heard that powerful work here. here. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh God, Christy, you want to, Pauline, I want to hear too from you carrying on this, this, the way, or, informed by the soil again, right? And I'll just drop this in here real quick. Like, okay, so there was a, something that was dropped on me last, when I went to Chris Trump's last teaching where all of the systems are in place. So every, when, when, when you dig into a soil and you disrupt the microbial dominance and basically the whole system shuts down, but every part of that system except the kind of the regenerative life force is still there innate in the soils and so when you're when you're looking at returning um diversity and returning like um some of the more indigenous microorganisms that you need back into a system what happens is it acts like a kind of a transference or like a spark or it has this kind of a chemical reaction and it basically enli it enlightens the entire field so it's not a matter of like one by one by one by one uh, but it's really just a matter of like igniting the system that's already present within us. So I kind of want to explore between Sharon and Pauline just what the mechanisms are, or if you have anything that informs that beautifully. But before we go there, Christy, is there anything you'd like to um, say? Well, I, I love what you just said because healing isn't linear, like Dr. Sharon has explained to me. You can't do one thing because it's not one thing that's made us sick it's not going to be one thing that's going to make us feel better. And, but, you know, if there was one thing, um, cannabis would definitely be on that list. It's as close to a cure-all as you can pretty much find on top of like, you know, awesome water, structured water and good hydration. Um, Cause you can't live dehydrated, although we do try to fake it. But when I have a few things I, 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 with Jordan's story, um, I think that we do need to assume that most people are traumatized and that the skin is an excellent delivery method. It is a bridge. I think the skin, like a cell membrane, the cell membrane is the brain of the body. And if you're getting information in or out, you're going to have results. And it's been absolutely fascinating to me how much people have healed through the skin because again as a nutritionist i'm always thinking you gotta detox and you gotta eliminate this and add this in and blah 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 i have seen it over and over again people heal through the skin i just had um a client uh, have a melanoma removed 20 stitches she lives in california she's gorgeous definitely was very concerned about the scarring so she, showed, she took a picture of uh, the scar and the 20 stitches the day after. She part, started putting it on a full spectrum um, immediately. The doctor said, you're going to swell up and turn black and blue. That didn't happen. And within three weeks, there was barely a scar. And she's thrilled. She's using it internally pre and post surgery, but also topically. Um, and I was... I, I'm constantly blown away, even though I always hear similar things, it's really just something you never get tired of hearing about how the body heals itself. Um, and then I wanna explain uh, something I, I just love, um, we were talking about yesterday is the opiate system, which um, cannabis works very well on. As most of us know, uh, people are drawn to cannabis because they can get off opiates and NSAIDs and all the destructive things they can do in the body. And the opiate system, back to the cell damage response, mod, uh, modulates social behavior, mediates physical pain, 
participates in social attachment and other aspects of behavior and emotion. And we can assume that a lot of people are also born traumatized, stressed out, bringing on traumas and mutations from their ancestors. So from fertilization to, um, to conception, to fertilization, to the end of life, we all need to have a healthy endocannabinoid system because not many people know what balance is, what normal is, and a healthy endocannabinoid system really just makes us feel more human. And I can very much relate to disassociating in the cell trauma and the theories that Dr. Sharon was saying, and you don't even know how far into trauma you are until you start to get out of it. And the endocannabinoid system has shown me how much trauma I was actually storing and holding on to, because the body works really hard at keeping things in. I can't deal with that. So the immune system goes, oh, I'll just, I'll just hold on to it until you've got more energy or more strength or more you know, nutrients to deal with that. And so until we're bottomed out and all this stuff comes out because we don't have any of that strength and integrity left, that's when people start waiting to take care of themselves. And you don't need to get sick to start taking care of yourself. In fact, that pre-disease state, which is like, you know, symptoms and headaches and IBS and all these little things that we just kind of think will fix or we can do something about, the endocannabinoid system can touch it can start that crosstalk between the brain and the gut and the immune system and the nervous system. And through heart math, I learned that the brain sends for every one signal that the brain sends down to the gut, which is obviously rich in endocannabinoid system receptors, there are nine that go up from the gut to the brain. This is a serious feedback loop and when we're banging on all cylinders of the receptors of the ECS, the immune system, which 70% of that is in your gut, 80% of your serotonin is made in your gut, a lot of neurotransmitters, and the gut and the brain are starting to communicate, then you get more balance through the hormones. And you start to release these traumas like Dr. Sharon and Jordan and Pauline have been talking about. And just like it's not one thing that makes us sick, we still have to be responsible for getting sick, right? It may not be your fault, but you still got to do, we want to be proactive about our health period, our health and keeping it that way. And the endocannabinoid system um, as that harm reduction center needs to be fed, nourished topically, internally. And I'm just so grateful. I can't wait to try your products, Jordan. Um, I'm going to have my massage therapist try them um, and hopefully call you because this is just great. Let me go over this slide real quick. Thanks for putting, putting it up, Peter. So we think a lot of people think of the endocannabinoid system as two primary receptors, cannabinoid receptor one and two. However, those are also G protein coupling receptors, which are abundant throughout the body. And it goes way beyond uh, just CB1 and CB2. There are more cannabinoid receptors in your brain than there are for all the neurotransmitters combined. So when we're out of balance and we're trying to communicate and you hear every fifth word, your body is not going to align. It's not going to get the right message. It might become over or underactive. It may produce too much cortisol or too little cortisol or do something that contributes to a disease, itis, et cetera. I really love that people are waking up to more of the endogenous cannabinoids too, because we've bottomed those out also. And the way to really boost those, we make them. What do we make them from? A whole lot of healthy fats. And that's why a lot of the neurotransmitters are also kind of considered uh, endocannabinoids because they're signaling molecules. This goes way beyond anandamide and 2-AG, which are absolutely essential, um, but this goes on to just making what the body needs so it can course correct. 
and we can become more human. That's sort of my wrap up for all, all the lovely ladies that I'm just like um, mind dumping. Do, do, do you want to hit the, uh, the other two slides? Oh, sure, yeah, absolutely. It will take just a second. So I, I use this picture a lot um, when I'm explaining the density of the endocannabinoid system because it seems so like, well, what is it and where is it? And is it really a system at all? Look how much bigger it is than all the other systems. It's because it's co-regulating and co-facilitating the crosstalk and the balancing and the neurotransmitters and the hormones and all the things that keep our body aligned and balanced and cohesive. It's a big system. Um, so this, you know, and there's receptors, just like Jordan was saying, all the layers of the skin that have different receptors on them, every single one of these systems have multiple different types of endocannabinoid receptors in them too, and they can be modulated and supported through um, cannabis. In fact, they, it might, you know, I consider um, cannabis an essential nutrient um, and everyone, you know, can figure out what those ratios for feeding their endocannabinoid system. But without it, we are very dehydrated and dehydration, as you know, will not get you very far. Um, and I love this too, because this is, this is not from Etho, Ethan Russo, who was the brilliant mind that coined endocannabinoid deficiency, clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. But these are just some of the symptoms that contribute to or, or um, are a result of clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. And of course, pain, inflammation, lack of signaling and inflammatory conditions and so the hierarchy of the endocannabinoid system, because it's a signaling system, is that it's always going to go to cell to cell communication first. I need to go from every fifth word to every fourth word to every third word until I'm hearing all the messages throughout the body. Then it works on tissues, organs, and then it becomes the guardian system and the guardian molecules. And so we can actually start to like protect our health and be, be in this place where we're not in fight and flight all the time. I can personally tell you how exhausting that is and how boring it is after a while and how disassociating it is and how I don't remember so many things because I've just spent so much of my life disassociating. Um, and then down to fertility and reproduction. This just blows my mind. Um, at ovulation, the uterus has a hundred times more anandamide than the brain. It doesn't mean it takes it from the brain. It just produces that much more, which just explains why that signaling isn't always happening for women. And then we have inflammation, which results in PMS, cramps, migraines, irritation, anxiety, insomnia, all around our cycles. And one of the beautiful things that the endocannabinoid system regulates is all the circadian rhythms and every organ has its own circadian rhythm. And so we really do become more human when this system starts cross-talking um, to all the cells in our body. So that's sort of it. I, I am just blown away um, and I'm blown away by the system. I'm blown away by the people who are, are out there sharing it and everything I'm learning because um, it, it's, it's definitely changed my life as, as for everyone here too. Wow, thank you, Christy, so much for that. Like, I love it that's, you know, oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm a little blown away. Um, I want to venture into sort of this bridging between allopathic medicine and alternative medicine that we can all speak to a little bit, but I kind of wanted to share a little bit that, are, that suggests that there might be something a little bit at the heart of our dysfunction when it comes to the systems and how um, they're not, you know, addressing um, these other systems that are actively informing between worlds, between our plant and animal kingdom and us. And so that's happening no matter what's, you know, how we're interpreting it. So I'm very, 
you know, we've got to kind of get up to date with how we're dealing with patients and this in our diseases and definitions and that sort of thing. But I'm sure everybody's source, a lot of people are aware of um, uh, germ theory versus terrain theory and how, um, you know, in the 1800s, uh, Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur came up with this. They were trying to fight uh, foodborne illnesses and basically set us up for a trajectory that put us at war with the microbial life because they were saying that it's specific germs or microorganisms that are responsible for diseases, plagues, pandemics, hello. <laughs> you know, and so we're kind of seeing the end of or the result of that kind of warfare and um, it's, you know, vaccines and uh, antibiotics and all that. And the terrain theory, which suggests that, um, that we're basically part of an environment and that the body is, if the body is well and balanced, which we've been touching on so much today, that the germs are a natural part of our lives and include viruses and pathogens and um, those kinds of things. But when everything's working in a diversity and a balance, that, um, that uh, it's, life is gonna function in a balanced way and that germs seek through a natural environment. They seek their natural environment rather than being the cause of disease tissue. So when you take away diversity, you're, you're basically putting the body into those kinds of modes we're talking about, fight or flight or freeze or a lack of microbial diversity or lack of being able to communicate with our outside world or with each other. And I just also think it's so beautiful how everyone's painted this kind of like uh, that, that in a diseased state, we're isolated and we're alone, that assumption of separation, which is not real, and that towards health, then we become more social and we actually are empowered with the ability to change our system and our world. So congratulations for that, fellow human beings. <laughs> but Pauline, Pauline, maybe you could take us into that sort of how to bridge with the allopathic type style medicine and what you, you know, how, how do we do that? How do we change our language? And you got to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Um, uh, here's Paul, by the way. <laughs> How do we change the language? Um, well, my experience is uh, as a patient, uh, as opposed to being a um, practitioner, um, I think the language um, needs to, to change Exponentially, um, you know, one of the the most challenging things I think, especially cancer diagnosis for is 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 how they can find a quiet space to develop the right philosophy on how to work. And what we're in Eastern medicine is surgery radiation. Those are that's our toolbox, and and so you know it's the only toolbox that we're offered. Um, so how do we delay that? But most importantly is, you know, how do we have this conversation with our doctors? How do we say to them, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not going to use your medicine, but I really want you to be um, part, of, part of my healing process. And I want you to hold my hand and I want you to hold me up. And I've chosen you. This is what I've said. This is what I said to my doctor. I said, you know, when I was, when I was searching for my team to personalize my, my healing, my medicine, my post-op, I was, I literally interviewed doctors. I didn't just go with the first doctor who came into my, my trajectory. And I made sure that they, you know, they aligned with, with my um, vibration, with my alignment, with what my belief system was because I think the belief system is is so desperately needed in your healing it's 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 a huge part of our healing and so I think talking to your doctor the, one of the first things they'll tell you and and Dr. Sharon maybe you can um expound on this is you know in the western world is that we don't know enough we don't know enough and I'm sorry, you know, we don't believe you should take anything. If you're going to do this chemotherapy, if you're going to do this radiation, if you're going to do blah, 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 blah. We don't know enough about cannabis or, or psychedelics um, to, to, you know, to expound on that with you. And, but what, but what they're not doing is um, they're not saying um, yes, go ahead and do it. And I, and I think that's where we as a community, 
as you know, from the bottom up, you know, it needs to really band together and say, no, you know, I'm documenting everything I'm doing. I mean, I am documenting my patients, I'm documenting myself. And, you know, the, the getting back to the stress and, and how it plays in this destructive mode is they don't give you enough time to think. They literally push you through their system. And so when I walk in or somebody like me who's doing alternative walks into their hospital or their, their center, they look down on me because I'm not going to make them any money, <laughs> right? Because none of my herbs are paid for. My natural path isn't paid for. My herbs aren't paid for. You know, we're talking, you know, $2,200 a month just for me to feel good and stay alive. None of my insurance covers this. So um, I think I, I veered off of your question. I apologize, um, Tina, uh, but I, I really feel that this is a huge issue um, on how we, how we can speak intelligently to the Western medical community and you know, get them to pay attention to us uh, in, in a clinical setting way. And that's why I stayed in the Western world because I'm asking them to pay attention. I'm asking, I've got the Mayo Clinic writing about me right now. I've got you know, City of Hope, you know, documenting what I'm doing. And we need more people that are choosing the alternative route to please, please stay, try to stay in the medical system, in the Western medical system too, so that we have more people uh, for statistics and that, because that's what they want you know, and, and, but what they don't, what they can't fathom is that a plant that, by the way, our government took away from us, you know, in the, in the thirties, um, the, the animals were already eating, you know, the hemp. And so the animals were getting the hemp into their bodies, you know, that, and we were eating the animals. So our endocannabinoid system was alive and thriving. And then when the government and shut it that down and made it a class one felony, we lost our endo, our, our cannabinoids, right? And, and so they basically took this regulatory system away from us because we weren't being fed hemp in, in you know, right? Basically in long-term, long-term hemp. <clears throat> so I think essentially speaking with our doctors, especially, um, patients who with life-threatening disease uh and and you know staying in your power um understanding that you do have a say in your healing you don't have to just put your doctor on a pedestal yes he's got more education than you maybe or she but you you as an individual if you get to know your body again i keep going back to that become your own best clinician and and it's a, it's like, you know, it's like Jordan and, and, and Tina and all of us women are saying on this panel is if we can get to know ourselves, really know ourselves inside, then that is going to project, you know, your healing and how you speak to yourself. I think Dr. Sharon talked about that is how you speak to yourself. You know, if you tell yourself that you have cancer and that you're Well, we, we just lost you, uh, Pauline. You said when you have cancer. You uh, are this healing light. Sorry, pa Pauline, we, we, we lost you for a second, right as you said, when you have cancer. Can you just repeat the next part? Yeah, I said, you know, when you have cancer and you continually tell yourself or that, that you have this, right? It's the law of attraction is, you know, it's like, look, if, if, if you say I have cancer, I don't even like to use the word on, I don't like it to come out of my mouth. I say my challenge, this is my challenge. I've been gifted this challenge. That's what I tell myself. You, you know, I've been gifted this challenge so that I can go through what I have to go through because I have the ability to speak to the Western world intelligently in the, in the medical field. And I have the ability to use all of my tools of the Eastern world, including, you know, studying in India for Ayurveda and, you know, being a Reiki master and, and you know, I didn't, 14 certifications of some sorts. But 
it is how you speak to yourself because you're speaking directly to yourselves. And that is the ECS. And so if you're, you know, if your endocannabinoid system is out of balance and you're speaking, you know, harsh truth and harsh words, you know, you're not going to be able to have that homeostasis we're looking for. So again, it's the, it's the, it's the understanding that we're all sentient beings. The plants are sentient. You know, it's how, it's what you say when you put the plants in your mouth before you eat your dinner, you know, saying, you know, thank you for this food that you've provided, all of those things. And, um, you know, letting your doctor know your belief system, you know, that you, you believe in cannabis, that you believe that you're going to use it. And, you know, you, you know, please understand, I'm going to use it if that's your prerogative, if that's how you feel, and then document how you feel while you're on it. So the more people we have doing this, the better chance we have to get this, you know, regulated in a good way so that we can all get it into our system that is so, so needed. I, did, I don't even know if that answered your question. <laughs> Sorry. Oh yeah, it certainly did. Yeah, it's just, you know, how, what do you, just, I mean, even just the little piece about giving yourself time, like when you're sitting in the office and the doctor's telling you that you, you not only in the same breath informing, that you, informing you that you have a cancerous tumor, but that you're gonna have to have a biopsy. And the only time I can schedule it is in about a week and a half, and then we're gonna rush you off into the, you're suddenly part of a system. So, I mean, just even, even addressing that time that time issue and and also understanding that in your own body that there is a certain amount of time that's required and that these are sequential steps that we have to go from a to b to c to d when we're healing and that that you know appreciate the process and stay and stay in the moment of the process and you can see i've seen it in plants you know just that when that plant goes into stress and it goes into like a freeze mode and it's not going to grow and it's not going to put do anything until it's comfortable it's really frustrating and all i want to do is feed it more fertilizer or like do something to help it along but really it's just having appreciation for the time it takes and i oh my goodness Je um, Je Je just quickly because i know jordan has to jump soon yeah. i wanted to ask and and since you make topicals but also getting into edibles what's your preferred extraction methodology and can you kind of talk about why and then uh, within the topicals and then for anybody who's focused on edibles, um, like, do you have a preferred carrier oil or? So extraction method, honestly, I prefer whole plant. I prefer putting the whole plant directly into the carrier oil uh, along with every other herb that I use. Um, I, don't can, have I can use, uh, um, when I work with hemp specifically, if I'm not using biomass and pulling from the oil myself and extracting that way, then I will use uh, a distillate. Um, I work with a company here in Colorado in Boulder that's actually a certified organic hemp farm. Um, every ingredient that I work with is organic. The essential oils, the carrier oils, the beeswax, all of the plant matter. Um, and so I... I found it important to also use an organic farm uh, for the hemp portion as well, since everything else is organic. Um, what was another question you asked? So, so first of all, uh, sorry, I was reading a message, but um, you, I, I understand the full plant extraction, but are you doing, are, are you doing like CO2 extraction, alcohol, hydrocarbon? So that's what I'm saying. Like, whole plant like the, the plant itself like the biomass i put into oil so i'm not using co2 or ethanol or any Perfect. additive or preservative or i don't work with those artificial ingredients i work with ingredients that the body can process the most easily because we're inundated with free radicals and poison all day long just from walking around and talking on our phone and being in front of our computer and all the things that we just do on a daily basis. And so when I lost 60% of my liver, it became not just about what was in my food, but also what was in my toothpaste, what was in my shampoo, and most importantly, 
my, my lotion because my skin is my largest organ. And if I am applying from head to toe, when I get out of the shower, a product that contains the first ingredient being water or alcohol or glycol, that's what you're primarily absorbing. And so I don't work with any preservatives. I do work with the antioxidant, antioxidizer, vitamin E, but that's the only preservative um, that I work with. Sorry, I hope that clarified it more. And, and did, did you say which oil you prefer using? So my, my oil in my salve is sunflower oil. I work with that because it's non-cosmogenic and it's out of all of the oils, it's the most likely to cause an allergic response in someone. And so that's, I've, I've tried a lot of different oil blends, but it's what I prefer to work with, with my patients, because we have people coming from around the world, uh, tourist wise receiving massage, or at least we did prior to COVID. Um, so I had to create something that was for the widest audience possible. And, and then in the oil, so you, you put the whole plant material in and is it sitting at room temperature? Do you heat it up uh, for how long? Well, um, so you can create topicals in different ways. I don't want to give too much of my proprietary information away today, but I will say that like you, you know, just as when you're making edibles, you want to be low and slow because plant matter burns. And when you start adjusting temperature, just like the process of decarboxylization, you can alter the cannabinoids, right? So you have to be mindful of that when making topicals as well. But I've learned over the years that the more cannabinoids you have, the more therapeutic the effect. I've made products that are CBD only for states that cannot have any THC. Um, and is it effective? Absolutely it is because we have receptors. Is it more effective when we can hit both receptors? Absolutely. Perfect. Um, I see over there questions. Uh, distribution marijuana versus hemp. Okay, so we don't sell our, our cannabis infused. We sell our hemp based products. When we go into patients, homes, hotels, businesses, event spaces, we use high THC products. Uh, the way that we are legal in doing so is I've never owned a brick and mortar facility in the state of Colorado. It's actually illegal for me to do so. So my business for six plus years running is we are a mobile service. By coming to you in the state of Colorado, I can share an ounce of marijuana with whoever I want a day. And so I have it in my topicals. I, yeah, I was going to say, and in whatever form factor you want to share it in, which happens to be as a topical. Exactly. So that's how we are safe and sound and have been for six years running. Uh, let's see over here, uh, Jordan videos and webinars to learn more about signing up for a whole class. So actually I just announced uh, my, I'm only going to do one this year and I'm offering 101 and 102 on the same weekend, which I've never done before because 102 was actually supposed to be launched at the beginning of this year. And then by now I would have taught it three or four times, but instead uh, to supply and demand what people are asking me to do, I'm going to do 101 on Friday, August 9th. I'm going to do 102 on Saturday, August 10th. And then I've partnered with Canaventure to do a hike with my group because combining cannabis in the outdoors is just an incredible bonding experience for people. And so I have done that in previous classes and it's really just taken the, the relationships that I've built with my students to the next level. So um, October 9th through 11th, I actually just put the event on Facebook. It's uh, under Primal Therapeutics and our cannabis massage 101 and let's see what else i think that's everything i would love to have you there tina and tina you had asked me questions earlier i don't remember what they were 
So if you want to ask those, I literally just put my scrubs on to go give some cannabis massages. So throw them at me and uh, I'm going to jump off. Do you you want to bring us into the massage room and you can just keep chatting? (laughs) I go to them, remember? (laughs) So I think Peter asked if there's a correction on the date. You said uh, August, but you mean September, correct? I meant October. Sorry. October, October. uh, for sure. October 10th. Okay. Um, The Saturday and the Friday. So 9th and 10th. Oh, and you mentioned Bliss. So I just announced that as well. We're doing Bliss on September 20th. Oh, that's beautiful. So that's cannabis infused massages, cannabis infused facials, uh, cannabis infused foot soaks, yoga, um, amazing food from Hempway Foods, um, organic, vegan, gluten-free hemp amazingness. Uh, So we would love for you to join us for that as well. Yeah, Jordy yes. goes all out. Her little waffles made out of cannabis, <laughs> shaped in a cannabis sleep. I just love her waffle. Her, the food is amazing. Yes. The whole experience is amazing. Um, but I was going to ask you about sort of some uh, other plant allies that you particularly like in connection with cannabis. And maybe that could segue into Pauline talking a little bit about some of the herbs that she's um, playing Absolutely. With. Uh, I remember you saying that for sure. So uh, one of my favorite internal herbs is milk thistle. So when I was experiencing all of my issues with my liver, uh, milk thistle has this incredible ability to rebuild our liver. And so that was one of my biggest allies uh, during my recovery process. I took a lot of it every single day. And it wasn't something that I was even aware of before everything happened with my liver. I had I had been so inundated by the regular science of medicine. Plants were something I thought were cool, but they weren't something that I realized they had this insane ability to heal me. And so milk thistle for me was one of those the really the first one in addition to cannabis that I was like, whoa, there is a whole world of plants out there. What else can they do for me? And that was how I created the recipe for my my product line as well. Each, Each of my products does not just contain hemp or cannabis. It contains several other herbs as well. And so one of those that I've used in several topical products for the face, for the feet, for the full body is chamomile. Chamomile is insanely healing and soothing and it grows easily in people's yards. And if you make a product for yourself at home, that's just chamomile and coconut oil, you can put that on any burn, any bug bite, any anything. And so when you start combining all of the plants, having an understanding of them, and of course, what doesn't work together is very important as well. Understanding either working with an herbalist or studying herbalism yourself, I highly recommend because you can really hurt someone. One of the herbs that I work with is comfrey. And comfrey and witchcraft is known as an herb that can, you know, either cure just about anything or can kill you. And so it's one of those things that you you have to know what you're doing if it's something you're going to work with and release a product that contains it. So those are a couple of my favorites. And uh, this has been amazing. Thank you so very much. And I hope everyone has an amazing day. Thanks, Jordan, so much. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, Pauline, what do you think? Can you give us a little bit of some of the herbs that you love to work with? And unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jordan, by the way. That was so fabulous. It's lovely to, to, to hear all about your journey and how you did it. And, and uh, I wish I was the one on your table. <laughs> um, so so my journey with herbs, uh, um, like, like Jordan, I... I my trajectory, my trajectory in healing was was not plants. Um, I, I've always loved being in the woods, and I've loved uh, my my my. I liked gardens, but I never thought <clears throat> I would go a complete um, herbal route. Some of the things that I'm taking, um, and and these are very medical. So if we have uh, listeners on on right now uh, that have cancer. Um, these are the these are the herbs that I would like 
and and our farmers our cannabis farmers please 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 these are some of the things that you could grow for us um that is really really needed um so angio stop um angio stop is is a it, uh, it's a Chinese herb and it's to inhibit a variety of growth factors um, for, for cancer. Uh, Andographis, uh, this is a very cooling herb. So, um, so if you run cold, if, you're, if you know anything about Ayurveda, if you run cold, if your system runs cold anyway, be very, very gentle with your system by taking the Angiographis, but it's to reduce your plasma, right? Your, your VEGF plasma. So your vascular endothelial growth factor. Um, and then you've got black uh, which I use because I'm, I'm, I also had a full hysterectomy. So um, that really helps to regulate um, and to normalize your hot flashes. Black cumin seed is another really wonderful one. Um, and that's also to reduce your veg up. Um, your regulatory T cells, uh, a lot of those herbs that are going to be used are Chinese or Chinese herbs. So I don't know if we can grow them here. I mean, these are things I'd love to talk to some farmers about because um, it's really, thank you. Yes. Um, neem leaf, um, you know, neem leaf is also to, to regulate your T cells. Uh, genistine, I take huge amounts of genistine right now. Um, and the other one that, that I think for everyone uh, to take right now is berberine. Um, berberine is probably one of the best things to boost your immune system. And we all need that throughout, throughout all of these COVID. Um, so, um, it, you know, it changes uh, berberine, that's it, yep. Um, and then I think, and curcuin, yes, that's another uh, herb that I take high doses of. Um, and curcumin is to normalize your fibrogen. Uh, yes, curcuin. So um, what I found is this in, in this journey uh, is the best thing if you're diagnosed with a life-threatening disease is to get the regional um, genetic testing done and then have that tested against you know your 40 or 50 herbs that you might be looking at and that will give you uh, an idea of what your cells will actually accept and not accept because you know you could be diagnosed with the exact same thing I have, which is stage four epi epithelial serous cancer, very fast growing, and you might go the immune uh, immunotherapy route, but my Keras testing showed me that I wasn't a good candidate for immunotherapy. So I had you know I I wait I in order to get my in getting my testing up front that allowed me not to waste a lot of time and my body, you know, because when you're taking these large amounts of herbs, you have to be very careful about your liver, right? So getting your liver tested all the time. I, I get my blood tested every four to five weeks. So I know what every cell in my body is doing. So if my bed Jeff is going up, then we take a look at you know, that chart that tells us, okay, you can use this, 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 or this for your VEGF to bring it down. And this isn't working, so we'll switch it out now. So it may work, that particular herb may work for eight months. And then all of a sudden your body will say, no, nope, done working right now. I'm not going to use you anymore. We've, got, we've gotten to, you know, your potential with this herb. So let's try another one. And in, in, in using plant medicine, it's, you know, it takes a little bit more time. It's not like taking an allopathic pill where you're getting an immediate result. Your body, like the cannabis, you have to titrate, you have to, you know, build it up into your system. So mm -hmm. again, the ECS is a huge part of that and balancing and allowing the herb to be absorbed and how it's absorbed and how long it's going to help you um, and for that particular problem. So, um, but, but thank you, Tina. I would love, love, love to team up with some farms in our communities and see if we can, even a small plot, it doesn't have to be a big plot, 
but my goal, my, 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 one of my dreams is to start a program where we can bring people in, you know, first of all, help them to, to help them to navigate this um, wrecking ball that's come into their life if they've been diagnosed with cancer or life-threatening disease, and then bring them to a place that they can be nurtured and they can learn about the soil, learn about the plants, learn how to grow their particular herbs that they need. I mean, your kitchen, just walk into your kitchen, thyme, oregano, marjoram, you know, all of those, the cooking, all of our cooking herbs are so essential. But learn, teach them how to grow a cannabis plant, teach them the cultivar, you know, teach them, you know, maybe get an endocannabinoid test done. And, and I would love to see farmers and, and cannabis farmers you know, really uh, like us being able to tie in and saying, you know, you need, you need a high terping of, of linoleum and, you know, you, your, 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 your cannabinoid system is going to allow that because, you know, you're not a good candidate for another terpene. So how can we dial in? How can we say, okay, you have this, this client and you've gotten all the testing done up front. And so we need to grow this type of plant you know, with this type of cultivar so that we have this type of terpene. So it's really down the road. I know this is, I know this is like, I don't even know that this is going to be done, but if we could do that, I mean, imagine, imagine the healing that could take place. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, even if it's just a half an acre on their property that we could just start growing this medicinal um, Imagine if there was someone else in SoCal right now near you in Ojai. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think I, I had brief, I mean, I think I briefly threw it at Leighton, but uh, I... I uh, you want to come in? Oh my God, look at the, the cameo. cameo. Don't be shy. Come on. Come on Don't be shy. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Hi, Hi, everybody. What's on? Hi. on? Beautiful. This is a beautiful conversation here. Wonderful. Leighton, were awesome. you the one stealing all the internet connection, all the bandwidth? No, no. <clears throat> we have a really weird system here. Um, it goes in and out. And I swear it's due to like, uh, what do they call that? Throttling. Like we use so much and all of a sudden things get really dicey. So no, I shut my phone off, uh, and I think the problem was a call came in and, and dropped you guys. But anyway, hopefully it's been fine since. Been Peter fine. Peter said that that maybe somebody in in Ohio. Oh yes, <laughs> our friend in Ohio. <laughs> I've been up to see him a couple of times, and yes, we have had some conversations uh, uh, specifically about different plants. Um, that are available locally, which is nice. Um, and so there's there'll be some further conversations for sure. And thank you for that contact. So I don't know if you guys want to get to because there were a lot of questions and comments. Um, but yeah. Cr Cr Christina, why why don't you throw something out and then I'll I'll yeah I'll get through do the some questions. Compiling, do some compiling. That sounds great. What a what a beautiful conversation we've had this afternoon. Um, I just want to kind of clearly like there were some of the uh, herbs that weren't on your list that you put up and I just want to go back and make sure I've got them right Pauline so mm -hmm. uh, angios, 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 angios stop, angios stop, angios stop. and then endographis, angiographis, angiographis. A yeah. and right. I'm sorry andrographis, a-n-d-r-o Okay, and then black cohosh was did that cut out from what you did you say black coha cohosh? Yeah, okay. black cohosh. Yeah, and I think everything oh, I missed that. Is on that list. Yeah, black cohosh, genistein, burb, it's berberine. Yep, curcumin is really important. Um, the Chinese herbs that Dan Shen is super important. Oh, mushrooms. Oh yeah. You forgot your mushrooms. Ban Zia Leon. That's B-A-N-Z-H-I-L-I-A-N. Yes, Sharon. Yep. Cool. I'm and then uh, I want to start mm -hmm. with the big, the first one you mentioned. It's angio because I might think of angiogenesis, but so it's angio. Before angio, you said anthropathics, you said angio something. Angio stop. Yeah. So so yeah, it's to stop the growth factors. Got it. Um, 
you know, kind of like a doctor, Dr. Sharon, maybe it's kind of like the CAR T cell. Oh, it's you know, sea cucumber. Okay. Sea it's cucumber. Extract of sea cucumber. Okay. Well, that's... we can't grow that. We can get that from. <laughs> um, but also, um, uh, dry, I take Dragonfly Earth Medicine's Myokanas, which is incredible. That's that's five, six different types of mushrooms uh, and some hemp. Aren't they a fabulous team? Oh my goodness. Hey, and I also Zach Bush's, you know, do you all know Zach Bush? Uh -oh. Do Dr. Zach Bush? Oh yeah, now you said it three times. I have to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you'll love him because, you know, he, he, he's a doctor that was on Answer to Cancer recently, a docu-series, but he, he was a doctor that came out of residency and started um, designing chemotherapies. And after a couple of years said, I can't do this. I mean, you know, you know, compassionately, I can't, I can't be the person doing this. And so he, he went back to the beginning because he came, he was grown up as a farmer. His parents were farmers. And so he, he talks about the soil and, you know, and the cell. And, and I also take something that he makes called ion. Uh, it's got, to, it's for, it's for your gut biome. Okay, cool. Um, are you familiar with this book at all? Um, Pauline Regenerate by Sawyer G. Christy mentioned yes. it recently. Okay. There's yeah, he's collection. wonderful. Yeah, there's a section in there and I wanted to kind of uh, bring Leighton in on this conversation because he and I are, you know, actively talking about biofilm and we don't have to go into depth about this at all. But like when Sawyer G is talking about um, cancer specifically, he's mentioning it in terms of it being ref, like it's almost like our systems attempt to revert back to another level of our, our pre-evolutionary um, system called the Meso 1.0 system or something. I have to look it up. But basically the cancer is acting in a lot of ways like, like a biofilm. Mm. Yeah, there so. was a study that just came out today um, on how uh, I think they were Chinese scientists actually smeared a biofilm on the outside of the space station. Uh, so it was exposed to full radioactivity, uh, zero atmosphere, um, and additional stresses of being out in space. And ironically, <clears throat> the biofilm lived. And it was uh, similar to what we talked about as, as uh, that these, these bio, biological cells work together in unison and some sacrifice themselves. So the top, I think it was millimeter or nanometer uh, died off, but in their dying off, they protected all of the cells beneath them. And I believe, and I'd have to look it up, but I believe that it was accumulated over a period of time that would be similar to uh, eight years. In other words, it would take that long for this to travel to uh, from Earth to Mars. It's basically a pan, pan, uh, panspermia. It's the theory of... Uh, all life on Earth came from comets and uh, meteorites and asteroids. <clears throat> and there's a lot of proof to this, uh, to this theory. And you know, that was just the latest experiment indicating how powerful biofilm actually is. And yeah. Yes, yeah, you know, mechanism and that it's a mechanism to basically restart evolution and that if we have that kind of respect for it and simply, you know, sort of create an environment that's going to allow for a succession. Uh, from that pre-evolutionary state to the kind of balance that we're used to that supports a life form like ours, um, that, that, you know, that's kind of bridging, doing some more bridging work, I guess. But anyway, thank yeah, you. Yeah, and yeah, and well, we need to talk about your balls again too, because there yeah, was some more work that's come out recently on this. That I've cool, sure. we'll, we'll get to that. Thank you guys. Um, um, and and just, just, just quickly, here's the updated uh, list. How am I doing? Uh, Andrographis, black cumin, neem, genistein, berberine, curcumin, black cohosh, danshan, angiostop, and then the myocana. Which is turkey okay. tail, chaga. Yeah, I'll get the bottle. <clears throat> Sharon, um, are there any herbs that you'd like to add to this list of things that you like to work with or like to see people um, sort of, you know, incorporate? Pomegranate. Pomegranate.
They're in the refrigerator in the flip top. Um, pomegranate was repla re re recently replaced my Dan Shen. So for a year and over a year, I was on Dan Shen. All of a sudden, my numbers went up for no reason at all. I wasn't doing anything differently. Um, and so we replaced it with pomegranate. Um, so reishi mushrooms, chaga, cordyceps, lion's mane, red belted conch, turkey tail, Chinese licorice, foti, ashwagandha, and hemp roots. Can you hold the bottle up? Oh, I can. Hemp roots? I was gonna ask a roots related question today, so I'm glad it came back around, that's cool. Yeah, and they're, they're, I don't know if you're, you're all familiar with uh, Dragonfly Earth Medicine. They're, they're yeah. part of the, they started the Dempier Collective, which Leighton and I are, are part of. And um, yeah, they're wonderful to work with. Um, this is a, this is a life-saving product, I, I think, for anyone uh, on the, that's been unfortunately diagnosed with this challenge. Thank you for sharing that. So, so thank you. In, to me, I, I think rather than a specific herb, it emphasizes the cannabis plays nicely with a lot of other herbs. And like most herbs, if we look at herbal traditions, whether it's Eastern or Western, usually you have at least four working together because the idea is one does this, the other does this. And in the same way we like whole cannabis, we like mixing things because they play nicely together. So I think, um, and that's what Pauline's sharing is that she's using both Eastern and Western whole plant medicine. One of the questions I would love um, to learn a little bit is the diagnostic testing. So having looked at genomic SNPs for years and just two years ago going, duh, there's CBD receptors, this vitamin D, if it doesn't work, it's gonna fit cannabinoids, you know, the essential fatty acids, figuring out that there was stuff I've been looking at for years. And then there was also a test we used in a clinic called the Greek test where we'd look at stem cells. And it was super pricey because we'd say, okay, what's going on in terms of cancer cells that are circulating and what stops their growth, be it standard Western chemotherapy or be it traditional and or lower the blood sugar. So I, you mentioned a test that I'm not familiar with. And to me, this is the integration of the wisdom of science and the wisdom of spirit and the, and the body and soul that speak to us and how do we integrate all of the energy, but there's, there's a wisdom, which is a structure. And so I would like a little bit more about what was that lab you're using on a regular basis to get information to guide. Sure. So, so the grease test, so we, that the RGCC test, that's the actual, um, well, let's call it the Greek. Name. Okay. Yeah. So, so we, we, call, we call it the Greek too. It's just easier. Okay. So, I was like the grease test. I don't know that one. Okay. So this is the Greek stem cell test. This is the Greek stem cell test Perfect. and you're right. Oh. It's pricey. I mean, I yes. just had it done a year and a half ago and it was, it was about $3,300. Okay. Um, and then the other test I had done, which tested my tumor, you know, not my blood. And that's called the CARIS, C-A-R-I-S test. Okay. Um, that one, it's the company is trying to, it's really having a fight with insurance companies, but they're, they're, they're holding their own and they're really trying to get this paid for. Um, and then, of course, they, there's a there's a company out now that that you can get an endocannabinoid test done. And it, which company do you love? Because there's so much noise in that field, and I yeah. think there's a lot of people saying they're doing it, but it's not reproducible. So, which company do you love in terms of the measuring some of what's going on? Um, we, well, we've only used the one, right, Leighton? The endocannabinoid yeah. test. Yeah, it's a wonderful. Thing. It, it, you see, do you remember the name of that company? I uh, we'll have to look it up. Um, but 
Uh, it's a wonderful tool, and you're right, Dr. Sharon. There's there's a lot of a lot of companies that are opening up, you know, putting their shingle out. Um, I think this is one of the first companies that that started, and and he's going to look it up now. Um, but once again, you know, it's it's at such the beginning stages. All of this, our knowledge is in just in the last five years has really grown. Um, but how do we now take the knowledge that we have and like with Dr. Russo to get, not to get off track with Dr. Russo and I had a long conversation about delivery, right? Because I'm doing it suppository because I can't function on THC. You know, it just doesn't work with my endocannabinoid system, right? So he said, I don't think suppository is going to work. Well, I'm proof that it's working. And I have a lot of patients that anybody that has a, ab, an abdominal issue, right? I'm saying suppository, you know, it, it, you know, it, if it's vaginal, you could do it vaginally or you could do it rectally, but for, you know, he's saying it can't work that way, but I'm proof that it does. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't understand everything. And so there's room for that. I mean, even with Jordan talking about the delivery system through the skin. And I mean, it's obvious that there are, there's more to this system. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so did you find it, honey? I'm okay. Well, I'll get back to the, the name of okay, the, but I, I think that's the important of the shared community learning and recognizing. And for me, I'd been smashed. My ego had been smashed early on. It's like, I can't know it all. So I have to pray a lot. Um, but basically, um, but this idea of the value of, you know, so just even the logistics, because we know that suppositories are used more in Europe. And so there's this Puritan culture. And so how do we get them? And to me, it makes so much sense. If we think scientifically, okay, we take it orally. We got to get through the stomach. We got to get through the liver. We've got, there's all of this variability in the processing. So why not, especially given where your original tumor was, to saturate, you know, if we know that skin works really well, why wouldn't suppositories travel along all of your, myofascial your 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 collagen and you know activate that system you know and i think if we look at some of the, the literature with men dealing with prostate cancer mm -hmm. it's like okay yes theoretically there's this capsule but if we use the combination of the topical suppositories lifestyle let's bathe all of the cells in the immune system and good stuff and something internal so that maybe we can carry it in the blood so I, I think this is where the combined knowledge and creating this community. And I, you know, as a healthcare provider who was involved in teaching doctors, I'm like, we've got to create good sources of information for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, Peter, if somewhere within your files and your interviews, you know, it's like the top fine websites, the top fine, I recognize it as individual, but if we could have some, these are some foundational. So for example, even as someone who's motivated to learn, you know, every time I'm listening to someone, I'm like, okay, what else do I know to know? I'm not exactly sure how to get this, except I now have started to partner with someone who's been doing it for 10 years and she's brilliant. And so it's like, okay, what do we tell the people with cancer and fibromyalgia and, you know, thin bones? But this book, I just discovered it like last week. And I'm just like, whoa. What is it? It's um, the health index, the cannabis health index. And talk about the integration of science and mind-body medicine. Yeah. This guy's done a brilliant job. You know, if someone had told me this existed two years ago, I could have provide, provided better care. So something about the efficiency in information transfer. So, you know, and Pauline, the brilliance of what you've learned on your journey. And there's, you know, so we're doing this one-on-one -on -one thing, but how can we create information that goes out? It's like, this is the starting. So, okay, so fine. The science and individualizing it, or based on listening, we have some idea of what a good starting dose for oral hemp is, you know? Mm -hmm. And then we 
titrate and individualize and encourage people to learn from their own body wisdom. And that another little rant. So when I started doing this holistic stuff in the 90s, you know, it was before it was cool. And people would come to me with garbage bags full of supplements because they were they were committed to the pill culture, but they'd have no idea why they were taking it or what the effects were. And so I it I spent a little bit of time being judgmental and critical until I realized we have been trained to dissociate mm. from our bodies. If we look at our educational systems, well, we've got kids sitting still for eight hours in order to succeed in academics. The only way they can do that is if they dissociate from their body and ignore the signals it's giving them. So all, so the, the reintegration of what is the body give information. Right, I, and I agree fully with that, um, doctor. And I think, I think what's happened is, um, I just lost my train of thought. I'm sorry, Leighton just asked me a question. <laughs> um, so I, I, I really think that, again, if we can all uh, somehow, maybe we can start a community, a Facebook community and, you know, let people out. But what, oh, this is what I found. This is what I found is that on these uh, Facebook communities or on these cancer threads, yeah. uh, what's happening is this, and you've probably seen this, doctor, with your clients, is they're overwhelmed. You know, you should, if you're a stage one, whatever cancer, don't go onto a site that where stage three and stage four people are talking, uh, number one, <laughs> because it has nothing to do with where you're at in your right. healing. And also all of these people, I mean, when people come to work with me, when they're diagnosed, somebody will give them my number. It's always been word of mouth. This person will call me and they'll go, I don't know what to do. And the first thing I suggest to them is get off social media. You know, don't, don't talk to all everybody because everybody knows somebody who's got cancer. And so they're going to say, oh, they use this and they did this and this work and that. Yes, but they're not you. This is what we have to pound into people. You are so unique. You are so unique at a cellular level that what, what, what worked for them yeah, it may work for you, and but are you, you know, are you going to throw everything in the kitchen sink, or are you going to get all your testing up front and be smart about your time and your energy? Because you know you're going to get stressed out, and stress is going to make your numbers go up. The first thing is stress. Yeah, and yeah, and so I think that if if we did, I I can't wait to get this book. Thank you for sharing that, the Cannabis Health Index, because. This will help my, my process too. And, you know, when we're, go ahead. Yeah, because he links the mind body. What are some of the belief systems and the talk, the, the intellectual talk to the body? So causing reflection, causing awareness and learning with a really, you know, good review of the science that in terms of efficacy, this is what some people have found. So mm -hmm. I, I, I love it. So yeah. And, and back to that point of people are given this diagnosis of cancer. And the first thing is this gut level. And so having been the bridge between conventional and alternative, which is now morphed into integrative, let's take the best of everything and identify what best serves you at this time the time to get into integrative and alternative and lifestyle and all of this isn't when you're in crisis. And sometimes having been there when people have tried everything else and nothing's working, when you're, you know, when you're treading water to survive, it's not really the time to learn new skills and new vocabulary and a new way of thinking. At the same time, I think those of us who are committed to this do our best. And to me, the, the idea is let's all learn about lifestyle and integrative and beyond the box of pharmacological medicine. Because people have come to me, I don't want to do anything West, Western. I don't want any prescriptions. And I've never, ever, ever put parsley in my mouth because it's green, you know? And so... 
I guess all of us holding the space and recognizing the time to make life changes. Sometimes, you know, it's like, I think you say the, the, the diagnosis of cancer is this tremendous learning opportunity and opportunity for growth. At the same time, it's a challenge. It's not like, yeah. So anyway, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just honoring your journey, Pauline. Thank because you, Because it's a super important message. And it's, just, you know, not everyone given the diagnosis is going to have that warrior-like commitment to have a foot in both worlds. And so I think that's the value of your message and the value of this community and the value of your journey and it rippling out and the message as an example, you're modeling it, you're holding it. So I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. The name of the um, company for the uh, endocannabinoid is my, you know, it's Endocana Health. E-N-D-O-C-A-N-N-A -N 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 Health. And I think they did a pretty good job. I mean, they basically, you know, go through five different systems, including your psychological state. Um, and then they, they put together um, various different, you want to give me the file? Various different um, uh, protocols um, with your cannabis. Wow. Yeah, which, which cannabinoids to use and which terpenes. For, for instance, they do an ECS on your sleep quality, on pain, um, and then they do the endocannabinoid DNA variant report along with it. They do cognitive function, anxiety, which is a big one, uh, de dependence, impulsive behavior, um, Opioid effects, because, you know, if you're doing opioids, I, I, I mean, there's another one that, you know, you have to know pharmacologically how it's going to react with everything else you're taking. And uh, psychosis, they also do psychosis. So I found this to be a really uh, well-rounded tool working cool. with clients. And so are they using particular people's products? So here they've got your DNA more or less some chemicals, some tendencies based on some Honey. patterns. Are they then saying- just, just quickly, is this the company? Endocana Health. I can't yeah. see it, Peter, unfortunately. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's Endocana Health, okay. Yeah, yeah. And they recommend the, 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 the different um, Cultivar. cultivars and terpenes to use together. So you don't, it's not necessarily product. You have to use such and such a product because it meets this, but more or less leaning towards a, a, a product with high beta carophylin or leading towards. So they don't necessarily say use this product. I'm hearing plants. These qualities. I'm yeah. Hearing plants. plants? Um, uh, yeah. Like, uh, so are they recommending based on chemivore then? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, because I did want to bring that in just because, you know, like they tried to reconstruct a plant based on all its, that they could study the cannabinoids and the terpene content and all the percentages and did not reach the type of med medical effectivity that they can. Yeah, they can't. Real, real, true, whole plant. So, yeah. Okay, good. I think, I think they are going to start making products. You know, I mean, I, I look up, look up their site. Um, I, I think whoever is behind this is brilliant. I think the people working there uh, need to learn a little bit more for, for logistic reasons. Um, but uh, it's been a good tool for me as a clinician to, um, you know, to, to see where they're at in all of those different phases of their, their systems. Uh, and which enables me to then say, you know, if you, you, you you've, you're going to have psychosis if, if you do a sativa, I mean, you're going to flip. That's me. I'm just going to be on the floor and I'm just, just going to vibrate like this. And I've done it. It's happened to me. I mean, I've literally convulsed on the floor. And, you know, thank God. I, I mean, I, I, I was by myself. I mean, I could have hit my head. I could have anything. I mean, I went down and I woke up. I had no idea what happened. So, I mean, there's this, this, as you all know, this can happen. And especially working with people who, 
get diagnosed with cancer. They're scared to death. They've never used cannabis in their life, right? How do you tell a 75 year old man that it's okay? Pretty difficult, right? So I love what Dr. Sharon is saying. And what everyone here is saying is that we do, we need to bridge this gap, you know, and, and, you know, help bring in the scientific, you know, with the energetic and the spiritual, because I think that's a good way in with people. Well said. This is cool. This is <laughs> Are you looking at it? I am. I just like, this is the answer to a prayer because having played with, well, I don't know, you know, to me, I go in and out of playing with the genetic genomic stuff. But the idea is having something that can help us. And, you know, one of the things I learned about when I was volunteering on the medicinal health farms, yeah, I tried 50 different products. I, you know, I took, it took me six months and I'm just like, we've got to be able to shorten the journey that people have when they start using this plant medicine. Cause you know, if I prescribe something that took three months before people felt effects, I'm like, I'm not really thinking that I'm doing a good job. And so how can we, and so this is one way of matching plant genetics and people genetics. And, you know, and I think that goes back to the wisdom and the science. There's always our smell and our, 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 our taste. So that to me is what I've been telling people to do is mm -hmm. smell it and taste it. Cause that's your innate body wisdom matching with the plant. Is it yummy or yucky? But so this, this is fun and it's not that expensive. Yeah. It's like $200. And once you've it's got not. that, it can then guide the journey. So, yeah, and, and for me, I, I'm really, really, I'm so blessed. I'm, but, but we all have this ability. Is, yes. is I'm able to, you know, drop into a meditation. I'm able to drop into my client's psyche, you know, because I'm an intuitive. And I can say, you know, just talking to them on the phone, their vibration. I can say, you know what, this person is not going to be able to do a point two zero. It's going to be way out of their, their, their bloodstream, their, their, their ability to function. We're going to start them even lower. We'll start them on a point one zero, And I may keep that person on a one zero for a month because, you know, that's how long it's going to take their body to assimilate and to, um, to grow. Some people, I mean, I've had a client, you know, every four days, she went up, a, a, you know, 0.5 every four days. And she, her threshold was a 0 0.70 of pure plant medicine, which is take, take Rick Simpson oil and multiply it by thousands. That's what we're putting in them. I mean, one drop of this, and I wouldn't give anybody something that I have not put in my body myself. I won't. But one drop of this, you're on the couch for 12 hours if you, if you do it underneath your tongue. If you're new, if you've never done cannabis. So once again, I think, you know, uh, people, how do people find their threshold? And that comes back to, do you know your body? Right? That, that's what, yeah, yeah, right, Christina? And also, where are you getting it from? Because mm -hmm. like, like you, Dr. That you yeah. have with the farmer and the farmer has the relationship with the land. It's all about reestablishing relationships with each other. It is. And, and like Dr. Sharon, I've had people come to me and give me shopping bags full in front of me and say, well, I have this and this and this, and it's all cannabis products. You know, it's hemp, it's CBD. It's, and I just, I don't even look at it. I push it back to them and I say, I have no idea where you got that from. 80% of what you're finding or 75% of what you're finding on the internet was CBD because it has no taste or smell, right? Is They're not even putting it in there. So if you don't trust your source, and all the dispensaries, I'm sorry, not very organic, even though they're, no, 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 I'm not going there. But anyway, right? So know your farmer and trust who you're getting this from. And, and people are like, yes, but it's so expensive. And I'm like, look, I am giving you what I know is 100%. You know, it's energetically prayed over. It's loved, it's, it's coming from that soil, that clean, clean, clean organic soil to your cells. And I know 100% what it is. So I trust it. 
And if you trust me, then we're starting on a really good foot. But if you go to that dispensary and put in whatever it is, I, I can't help you. I don't know what you're putting in you. And I'm not saying, you know, if you, you don't have to buy from me, but know your farmer, know, know, know your practitioner also. And, uh, and, you know, it's, I think, I think it, it's, it's going into that direction. It has, but I, to, because like, like if, okay, so let's just put, put it on an economic scale. If we're losing, if we're failing through our economical system, then it's going to fall to local communities and kind of a decentralized kind of a sharing modality that the internet is still offering us in a way where we can come together in these small groups and just, and disseminate information, but just think what it would be like if I, you know, I was the cannabis farmer in my neighborhood and everybody came to me within walking distance to gather and help make their medicines in the, in the evening time or in the oh, beautiful. After, after the next neighbor is done with his harvest like we you know it's not that hard and we haven't been out of that system very long and who wouldn't want that back at this time so I just feel like you know decentralized and know your farmer is really a good first step I mean I love that so much so and I love what Peter said yesterday of, you know, the de deregulation, but you know, how can, why can't the farmer, the, the little farmer go to the farmer's market and share with his family and his friends? And, you know, I mean, it, that's really, you know, understanding that it's all of us bringing this together for everyone's health, but we can't monetize it. The pharmaceutical company can't monetize it. So they're going to continue to try to keep well, us squashed. We can squash. come up with our own systems of economy. We can certainly like, you know, have a Lala coin or a Peter coin or a Sharon coin, you know, and figure out what that <laughs> looks like, which I'm all excited about. So. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's, um, it's a, a beautiful thing, but, but, but Tina, so... So can you tell us a little bit about, because I know you've talked to Leighton and I a little bit about how, what you make, and, and we've been so fortunate to thank you to, 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 to try it. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, I might want to just approach it kind of in keeping with the conversation where one of the most elegant systems within a Korean natural farming or natural farming that was brought to us by um, Master Cho Gun Q out of Korea that he did a demonstration garden in the 60s and you know he perfected a system that he had obviously um, inherited from some teachers probably Japanese and you know probably farther back it's an ancient teaching but like one of the most elegant parts of it is the system where you go out into your natural indi indigenous environment and you cultivate the diversity of organisms that are indigenous that are indigenously there that have that have gone through an evolutionary process over eons to just arrive at that time and place with the perfect ratio of things that are going to, going to allow for a living system. And you're placing a rice, rice box there and you're growing out this diversity and then you're bringing that back and you're with this great deal of respect and reverence introducing that into the system of natural microbes that are already in your system or that network of things that is just latent and awaiting a kind of revival, right? So then to actually sort of do that as a practice and then to be in awe within the observational art of seeing it happen and then eating that food and introducing that kind of microbial diversity into your system and then suddenly you're starting to see better, hear better, you know, have relationships with your neighbors that are either, either good or bad. Might have taken petitions out on me at times because I've got a weedy damn garden. <laughs> but anyway, so there's conflict and bumps along the way, right? But uh, so, so basically through that act of coming into relationship with indigenous microorganisms, understanding how they work in the body, then just applying it towards different aims. Cause I have really solid clay soils here and it's really hard for me to grow things. And I've had to learn how to create microclimates which I'm very excited to try some. And I have tried to grow some Chinese herbs. And so I'm really interested in figuring out where within our world we can create the environments that are gonna be conducive to these types of relationships that we have with plants. 
um, that are our medicinal allies, right? And I want to do it cheaply so that anyone can do it or anyone can achieve it just based on this system of being playful in your garden. Um, so yeah, so the particular one that you guys are familiar with was me addressing my severe clay soils and understanding how to apply this indigenous microorganism technology to harvest microorganisms that are farming the clays and the soils to then offer it to the next tropic level of insects that are then gonna offer it to the next level, to the next level so that we can have a thriving ecosystem. And uh, doing that in an observational mode brought me smack into talking about biofilms <laughs> and learning about cancer and learning about our microbiome and having these great conversations with thought leaders like you guys. And then, you know, just it's a matter of coming together and sharing information and talking about our truth and walking the walk. And that's all I got to say. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. It, it's uh, it's you, you make amazing products, by the way, everyone. <laughs> Did you try do, the RSO? Do, do, do you have any within reach? You you you're talking about the ball. Oh yeah, you mean oh, oh you mean I only have one of my balls. I don't got two of them. <laughs> <laughs> I left one at home. <laughs> so this is clay that has been through a system of of processes that start out with a very diverse uh, population that's inherent in our indigenous. Um, environments that are aqueous in nature and um, doing the work of breaking down the clays. And um, anyway, so these are, this is an isolated diversity of IMO that is specifically facultative anaerobic. So those are the organisms that play around in those uh, regions of um, the in-between regions, right? Where, um, where all life plays, you know, you find life is in the margins, right? So um, so those facultative anaerobic bacteria are a very interesting class of microbes that I think are going to deserve a lot of uh, accolades, a lot of celebration, not so much the apprehensive fear that they're being approached with now because the other things that are facultative in nature are things like candida or, uh, you know, these pathogen pathogenic expressions of these colonies of microbes are doing things to the body that we're recognizing as not life supporting because they're trying to use what they have they're in an acidic condition they're in your body they don't have you know they're they're in a, a body that's kind of gone through those stages of stress that bring it into those definitions that we don't want to name as cancer and so um so in some ways it's like staring the beast in the eyes you know we have to understand where what why we're ascribing those beast-like qualities to things that are really profoundly operating in our world and are quite accessible. I'm no, I mean, I went to school for writing. <laughs> I'm not a <laughs> I'm your journey and you've got great communication skills. So to me, part of, when we started this conversation early on in the chat, there was this question about, is this woo-woo, this energy healing? And I think if we look at the wisdom of science, and if we look at some of the science that's coming about mycelium and plant roots and the ability for something to happen here and it be transferred something there. So we can talk about it being the strands of physical, or we can say, oh, there's some disruption. It's a chemical fiber disruption, it's a chemical. So I would love, to me, if we're talking about these living soils, and if we're saying that we are living soils and we want a diversity, you know, my view about my immune system is I am a mixture of viruses, bacteria, parasites, yeast. I am this diversity. And because my immune system is in balance, I don't worry about it, you know? And so I guess to me, using the story of what you're creating with these living soils and a review for me, cause it's been a while, the science of mycelium and the plant roots and you know, what you're trying to do is get to a higher level of consciousness in the soil. Yeah, and allowing for the relationship that exists, which informs us that we are a consortium and we are part of a stratified existence that is constantly co 
co-messaging in real time and space like we're having communications with our environment whether we know it or not and you know the smoky atmosphere should inform us the fear you know the fact that we're catching fear from each other within, within this pandemic environment like there's so many things that are just screaming to us like pay attention to the subtle and pay attention to the way microbes interact with us and speak with us which is very much about like Electromagnetism. I mean, Leighton can talk about the electromagnetism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's. Um, I'm I'm so blessed. I have so many friends that are just so knowledgeable, and he and I've shared this with you. I have a group um, that I uh, have a weekly study group with, and um, we were working on viruses, ironically, and how. Um, really each cell has a virus that works with it and this, the virus is actually the great corrector so if something gets out of whack it actually takes that out and creates a balance back into the overall system and that's what we're talking about here is the overall system and so <clears throat> we through evolution have been changed billions trillions numbers we can't even comprehend um over by viruses and you know some of them affect us some of them hurt us some of us cause uh, evolution and some of them cause um disappearance or destruction uh on a, either on an individual cell or a total life force um so that's something that hopefully i'll be able to really dive down a little bit deeper um in the near future as we get further along in this in in, in this process and um, you know, that goes back to these chemical signaling, intercellular communication, uh, paramagnetism, magnetism, electricism. Uh, I mean, you, have anybody heard of redox? And redox is the redox potential is the view of a plant as an electrical circuit. So it's the measurement of electrons and protons going through the plants. And what they found is low EH, low, EH, low pH actually hits a sweet spot where the plant has all of its defenses intact, will not get any uh, fungal or pathogenetic fungus or any insect uh, infestations. So again, and these all tie back into the same exact conversation about soil health and body health. And they are the same. They are one and the same. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be, you know, the very cutting edge of a lot of this new technologies that comes out um, and the science behind it. And, you know, going back on Doc's, you know, thought on, on, is this woo woo? No, no, it is not woo woo. There is so much information out there now proving that we just were not very intelligent in what we've been stating and, and doing for the last, you know, 100, 200 years since, since science really started to get a handle on on bigger picture stuff um so it's it's a great time to be alive as far as that's concerned uh some of the other parts of life right now are a little bit more challenging to say the least um but on the science side no it's it's you know we're really getting close to to asking a lot of deeper questions you know whether it's quantum biology quantum mechanics quantum physics and we're, we're getting, getting some really good startling answers back now. And, and so, again, it's, it's a great time to be alive. And I'm just so blessed to have, you know, friends at this level that I can uh, really go down rabbit holes with on, a, right. on, on multiple levels. It's so good. Such good yeah. time, Zoe. And I think, I think one other thing is that most people misunderstand is soil should be looked at uh, three ways. Um, first, it's the physical. Second, the chemistry. And third, the biological. So by physical, I mean, yes, sand, silt, and clay and organic matter, but also water, uh, vapor, sun, wind, weather, temperature. Those are all parts of the physical. Um, then you have the chemical. What is the makeup? What am I missing? What do I have excess of? And last, the biology, because the biology take all of those things <clears throat> and make them work in unison, kind of like the endocannabinoid system. So um, in the future, hopefully people don't just say, well, I had a soil test. Well, all right, great. You got one third. <laughs> at, at, at best, you have one third. Yeah. Uh, let's, really, let's really talk further about the other factors that are, are um, you know, combining to make this either healthy or unhealthy. And then even looking at the plant, the way the plant has an intelligence of its own and is able to like communicate 
those very conditions you talked about, the sun and the winds and the seasons and the changes that are there. And like even through an RNA expression, communicating that to their seeds or us through our expression, communicating it to our progeny or, or a plant medicine, you know, communicating within our endocannabinoid system or so. Yeah, and it gets, it gets a lot more complicated. One of the guys in the study group is a geneticist and um, he keeps going back to this like concept that you're not, your DNA isn't you. Your DNA is, is simply a, uh, an instruction booklet um, with a lot of deviations. And so, yeah, it's important, but it isn't, it isn't the end all be all the way we have already always looked at it. And, you know, again, these, these are rabbit holes that are going to just blow up on, on our understanding of, you know, how on a molecular cell, a molecular level, these cells are actually uh, functioning and it, and it gets into epigenetics, which is, you know, the, the next level, right? So um, yeah, head, heads up, man, more to come soon. Can't wait to, can't wait to really, you know, be able to speak intelligently about all of this and try to put it out in layman's term because, you know, the geneticist speaks in a whole nother language. I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> and I let's, white let's bring him on. <laughs> Let, let's bring him on uh in the next aye, week aye. or so but yeah. but can, can, can you give because people were talking at uh g unit and nate were talking epigenetics uh can, can you just kind of give a scratch well, the surface of epigenetics right. i'll scratch it so basically what it is is the understanding that genetics can um uh not well mutate might be a way uh, evolve is another way um, that the influences on a molecular level will actually create and, and change the way um, the genetics are actually functioning. So that's, there's your snippet. And, and you know, for me to go further would be uh, foolish um, until I completely can wrap my head around it. But it's really kind of taking it to the next level, like, you know, us discovering an atom was cool, right? Or discovering a molecule was cool. But, you know, those things are, are now like, look at it like uh, a spore, a fungal spore. We now know that inside that fungal spore is a whole nother universe that we have no idea how to interpret at this point in time. And where epigenetics is, is part of that understanding of like, all right, how do we pull apart a whole universe now? On, on a on a level that we can't study because it's it's theoretics. We don't have the tools yet to do this. Um, you know, except like redox, are, right? Except that we are informed by our, by our intuition. And like, um, have you like this book? I love this book so flipping much because it goes into RNA as opposed to DNA as mm -hmm. an expression vehicle for those very like uh, real life changes that are then like translated into a history that are inside those spores spores you know what I mean like I think everything even water carries with it the whole entire history of everything that it's been through from a generational standpoint to set it up for like regeneration into the future and that it's not necessarily a DNA genetic um, uh, vehicle but it's an RNA expression yeah yeah and that's there's so much truth to that and and you know can I talk yeah, sure. And also, and also, you know, I had all my genetic testing done. Um, there's nothing, nothing in my genetic history that shows any ovarian cancer anywhere. And, and there's nothing that shows any BRCA1 or 2, because if you're a stage four, that's where it normally goes to, right into the lung, into the heart, into the uh, breast, right? I had nothing, zero across the board. Yeah. So, you know, again, I think what you're saying is, you know, genetic testing is isn't the end all and it's only from what i'm reading in the past especially two years it's it's really in their diagnoses it's 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 10 percent. it's 10 percent is is what they're getting from genetic testing That's right it. and i'd like to add a little bit to this because so we've got the plant genetics the people genetics and having really spend a lot of time in what this epigenetic stuff is and how it affects health. So the way I, <coughs> I see it at, at, at two levels. So I, I talk to people, it's about recipes, that you inherited recipes from your mom, you inherited recipes from your dad. And so maybe your mom made chocolate cake with a half a cup of cocoa and maybe your dad's family made it with two cups of cocoa. 
your recipe book because all it's doing is giving information to create proteins, to create things, but you inherit it and it's unique. And then depending on the life you live, what, you know, do you have enough of the cocoa to make the cake? Do you not? That it's always subject, depending on what you bathe it in, the water, the air, the food, the emotions, the chemistry, these are all molecules. So they're going to read, they're going to change. And so at the chemical level, DNA is totally subject, but at the same time, we inherit these recipes. So when I see people in my office, I get the sense that these are the wings, the life of all of their ancestors is coming together in this structure. So in the same way that Leighton, that you break things down into three, I'm breaking things down in life, we've got a structure. So are we sleeping? Are we moving our structure? We've got a chemistry, what's the food, what's the hydration, and then we've got an energy. So if we talk about DNA, it is this interesting chemical, which has a particular structure and it organizes light. Mm -hmm. And if you take DNA and put it in a room, it's going to organize those photons and it will continue to do that even if it's not physically there. So to me, this business of dancing with DNA as in looking at it in terms of physics, because if you look at physics, it's all vibration. And so to me, that's the story of DNA. So, you know, they, to talk about some of the epigenetic studies, they took these poor little rats and they rang a bell and shocked them and then rang a bell and shocked them. Those grandkid rats, by the time they inherited this information from their parents. And so these poor little grandbaby rats, you'd ring a bell and they'd have a nervous system response. So what are the information that we inherited and how can we turn off the stuff that's no good and activate the stuff that's good? You know, mm -hmm. and it's through the life choices, it's through what we're putting in and how we're saturating these light photon organizing molecules. So kind of what you were talking about in the soil, it's like, yeah, so let's let's honor all of it that's a eloquent way of putting it thank you that that was beautiful and i think that gives a good visual for people to understand yeah. a little bit more about dna and we've yet there's still a lot more to learn and, and, and you know and, and the rna because, yeah what turns it on what yeah. and the rna and you know, it's all this big beautiful matrix but mm -hmm. just quickly uh leighton and pauline so you both got an endocannabinoid test can you talk about like, are your endocannabinoid systems similar or different? Um, actually, I did not. I did oh, not get okay. the test done. Um, you know, I didn't think it was necessary. I, I do partake. Um, I have the things that I like um, where Pauline was not much of a user. So in order for us to feel comfortable about getting a, a good foot forward in the direction of what cultivars would work best with her, her system, um, we felt it was necessary. And then after we got that test done, I was able to start uh, communicating with that company about um, specifics and trying to interpret uh, their, their meanings because the, the right now it's still in probably the infancy uh, of what that test is going to end up to look like in the near future. Um, but with the right questions, I was able to get the information I needed to direct her or, or the people that I like to work with um, that are growing our medicine um, to carry a few different cultivars that would work more uh, cohesively with, with her system. And after that experience, uh, we started, she started recommending that to pretty much everybody that, that this is, if you're going to use cannabis and you haven't been using it in the past, then you have no idea which cultivars make you anxious and which ones make you intelligent or excited or, or which ones lock you up on the couch. And so it's, it's kind of a, a great way to get a, some kind of direction in this, you know, uh, multifaceted view of, of um, the body versus the cannabis plants, because each cultivar has a lot of different um, functionalities to it. So, you know, that's, that's why it's recommended. And for Pauline specifically, what are some of the cultivars you've kind of narrowed down to? Um, she does, she's not a good on the gases. So she's more in the fruits um, and the earth, earth tones. So, uh, you know, any of the, you know, OGs or Cushes, no, nah, that, that they take her out. <laughs> you don't want to see me <laughs> We had her walking in circles for a couple of weeks in the beginning. And I was like, all right, 
that one's not working. Well, we got to figure this out. And then somehow I think we're, I was talking or we were talking to Ethan and he had mentioned about this test or this new test that was coming out. Um, and so we got the test on it. Was it Ethan? It was somebody. Somebody mentioned to us about, you know, that this new test had come out. And that was quite a, quite a few years back. I mean, um, it might have been Ethan. It might have actually been Ethan Russo. So what I'm hearing is, and this is what I've seen about some of the genetic testing, is there's a gap between, okay, so this is, this is what the epigenetics says, and the actual translation to clinical. Mm. So Leighton, what I'm hearing is as a cannabis-informed <laughs> grower, knowledger, you were able to translate the results into actionable. Yeah, I'm, yes. I've already gone down and I've got the report, but what I'm also hearing is we still need cannabis informed people to sometimes interpret the results. It's not yes. coming out as a, these are the terpenes that would be better, or these are the names, you know, we, you and I know that the names of plant strains, you know, I know in Fort Collins, it's going to be different than, you know, South Colorado. So I guess part of what I'm trying to actionable, if I go ahead and invest or send people for this test, um, are they still going to need a translator of the results? Uh, I would tend to say yes at this point in time. Now, we haven't done another test um, in the last probably year, maybe 10 months. But one of the conversations I had with uh, a person over there was, hey, are you guys going to get to the point where you really kind of say, you know, specifically which cannabinoids and cannabinols uh, and terpenes are best for this profile for this person. And I believe that's the goal, or at least that's what they indicated to me was that, that they were going to get to that point, which would make it a lot easier for people to interpret this report. Um, unless, and again, unless you're, you know, you're in the, the industry, you know, you're not going to know the difference between a gas and a, and a flower or, or a gas and a, you know, an earthy toned uh, cannabis plant. But if you're a breeder or a, a heavy consumer, then, then you will understand, you know, these directions pretty quickly. So basically this is, this is, um, well, this is one of my patient's uh, reports. I'm gonna give you the ECS cognitive function because uh, this is one of the things that we, want, he wanted, we wanted to work on. And so they suggested a balanced THC rich formulation with CBD and THC ratios from one to one to one to 20, depending upon your tolerance for the THC. So once again, they're gonna have to do their work to titrate. So, you know. And there's a huge difference between what we call, uh, you know, a one to one to a one to 20. I mean, that, they're, they're, those are night and day. So yeah. again, you're, you're, you, you really gotta do some interpretation on this stuff. And then it says the primary and secondary dominant terpenes of limonene and pinene are ideal. Higher THC ratios may be angiogenic, therefore consult your healthcare professional for questions. Once again, they're giving you suggestions, but we're not nailing it down. So it's, 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 it's in its infancy and we are all part of helping create something that is more usable and more user friendly. And it's- yeah. I wanna send out just some OG respect, however. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Because, because, because I just, just to support it, um, like I was at a conference here in Colorado when they were first doing the genome project, right? Where a couple of scientists getting up telling us all these things they understood about the genetics of the plant that us growers were like, yeah, we already know that, but good. I'm glad you're discovering that and um, being annoyed generally. But one of the things that they came up with was as they were mapping and linking all the chemo bars to the names that had been applied to them was that there was a astounding amount of uh, just adherence and level of integrity in how these um, growers had brought forth the plants and had been true in their naming processes. And so just respecting this as an oral tradition within our cannabis OG community that, that there has been a lot of this work being done in the subculture that is cannabis and needs to be respected and needs to be listened to. So that's all. No, that's an important point. And so I think giving voice and expression to the subculture is part of what these conversations are about. Yeah. 
just quickly uh hold on let me go back to the chat uh for Pauline, uh, G Unit asked, uh, "Is the tumor expressing cannabinoid receptors? Uh, and did she test to try to compare her tumor to her normal tissue sample?" I'm sorry, Peter. I didn't hear the question. Well, with cancer. Uh, you know, is the, does the tumor have cannabinoid receptors? Uh, well, the RGCC test proved it did. Because if it's causing apoptosis, it's, it's talking. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yes, I would say yes. What do you think, Dr. Sharon? Oops. Two things. I think the question was two things. So just to clarify, going back, RGC is the Greek test for circulating stem cells, circulating cancer cells. So it's a blood test and you're looking for the level. Are there, because people don't die from the local cancer. The problem is when the cancer infiltrates other things. So I think that that's a different answer in that. So the RGC is looking at does this kill the cells? Does this kill the cells? It's kind of like putting things and seeing what suppresses its growth. But I think from Peter, I think the question was on your Keras testing, did they, did they test the tumor cells for endocannabinoid receptors? And I have a, and I think you're saying is that the technology of the Keras isn't necessarily up to date in terms of cannabinoids and testing for receptor, cannabinoid receptors. Did I get your, that question right? I think that's what I was hearing. Well, I, I was trying to read G Unit's question. So, uh, G Unit, if you can chip in on the chat, if I ask the correct question, <clears throat> if you got a satisfactory answer. Um, and just quickly, I, I had pit, a little while back, I had pinged Len May, who uh, is the founder of Endocana Health. Uh, so, he may pop on. Um, let me go to, sorry, I have uh, their, some lawn, someone's mowing their lawn outside. Um, I think until G, whoever it calls back, I think for me, uh, part of the- Yuna said you asked correctly, okay. Um, so to me, part of the other things about genomics and the way I'm using it is that we know that the cannabinoid system has to do with how do we absorb and use fatty acids. So do we have enough of the essential omegas? We know it interacts with vitamin E. We know it reacts with the gut. So there are people who have genomic challenges and expressing how they use these nutrients. Do they need a higher dose? Do they need it activated? There's people whose gut isn't real good at producing that slime layer. So these are the people who, if they consume probiotics every day are actually gonna do better. You know, there's some people whose slime layer is really good and so they can get healthy bugs interacting with the, the intestinal cells. So to me, part of the way I've used this genomic e endocannabinoid. So to me, I don't want just the endocannabinoids, but how good are they at arachidonic, arachidonic acid? How good are they at processing fatty acids? How good are they at integrating fatty acids into the cell membranes? So this is where some of that can also affect using some of the other lifestyle supplement nutritional things. So are there some tests, Sharon, that would uh, test some of those things that you particularly like? Yeah. And so I, I'm playing because, you know, in medical school, they taught us 80% of what you need to know is in the history. And so 10 to 20%, maybe some extra diagnosis to confirm or to guide it. So having done this functional medicine stuff before it was cool, I'm still kind of praying, meditating and learning. So there, so I'll do a blood test. Okay. Look at the omega threes and the omega sixes in the blood. Look at the homocysteine, look at some of the nutritional things that are inexpensive. If we want to do a genomic test, 
there are some markers that tell me how people use vitamin D and whatever, but I got to, I work with a holistic nutritionist who's brilliant at the epigenomics. And so I kind of like, because she sees things and she sees the, she's like clairvoyant. So she sees the chemical pathways. So I'm still, I kind of individualize it based on the history of what people want. You know, it's so, it's not as clear. And I, I love that Pauline says, yes, I got this diagnostic testing. And that's awesome because sometimes I'm waffly about, well, is the testing going to change anything we're doing? But I think for Pauline, it's super important because she's a pioneer in educating doctors. And so she's got data and a lot of thinkers, whether they're doctors, I mean, some of us are data driven, some of us are relationship driven. <laughs> and so she's got both. So. Sorry, I have like 80 windows open. Um, Great potent pause that allows us ha, to appreciate each other. Right. <laughs> How about uh, Sharon? You you had you were chatting in the chat with uh, Nate L talking about the Pichotti method, or how do you pronounce that? Yeah. So in the oops, here we go. Okay. So I think I'm unmuted. So the idea is there. You know, is there's this idea that if you use cannabis, be it hemp, be it marijuana in the belly button, you're going to get kind of really cool things. So my answer to that is as a Western trained physician who understands the anatomy, the, phys the physiology, the fascia, I'm going to like, well, not so much. But as a Western trained physician who's also studied Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine, what we're doing with that umbilical input access, it actually has to do with energy channels. So our life energy has a, a way that it, it moves. And so I'm not exactly sure I understood the, the question completely. My interpretation is in Chinese medicine, they're super respectful of the umbilicus. They will not stick needles in it. Bad, bad. They occasionally will put a little bit of moxa in it but most of the time they go around the belly button. And so I guess if people are wanting to experience THC through the umbilicus, okay, let's go topical. Let's not be burning things in it. And to me, Jordan's approach about we've got all of these receptors and all over our skin makes a whole lot more sense as a way of getting cannabis into the body than focusing just on the umbilicus as one bridge or entry point. I think that answered the question. We'll find out in the chat. Uh, Susie Sherlock had said a while ago, no one has spoken about looking at microbiome where we have dozens of pathogens that create toxins and biofilms that are never tested by allopaths. Can I, you know, I, I guess I'll answer quickly, then I want to go to Christina, because you and I are, you're like, it's the soil, it's the diversity. So the reality is, having done this functional medicine stuff since 1990, and ordering stool tests, and looking at the microbes, and looking at the biome, and looking at what grows, the reality is, despite the fact that as doctors, we can do stool tests, and we can see the good stuff, we can see the bad stuff, we have been really ineffective at changing the gut to deliberately make good things grow. So fine, we spend all this money on probiotics and the idea is you've got to change the soil. So yes, you do have to remove some weeds, but that's why I care about the slime layer that all the good stuff's growing in. And if you have healthy stuff. So I'm going to let Christina say, even if you can measure it and using the, the metaphor from what you're doing with soil. Yeah more than just a metaphor, I, I mean, like, so removing weeds is one thing, but understanding why the weeds are there is something con completely different. And so when you get back to this kind of understanding and maybe, you know, being informed by the differences between the germ theory, theory and the terror theory, because microbes in and of themselves are not um, evil or bad. And not only that, but all these things are mutable, especially when you get down into these levels of microbes acting in a way that seem to be anti- anti 
biotic, um, that even those types of microorganisms can come into a relationship and change the way they're presenting completely different and in ways we don't even understand. So when you, so diversity is king, diversity is queen, uh, that's it, that's the final line. Like if you have a diversity of microorganisms working in concert with one another in the way that nature intends it to be, then you will automatically come into balance and those pathogens that would normally act in an antibiotic way are just kind of part of part of part of the community, you know. And if we start looking at which ones to take out, you know, you're looking at an authoritarian system, which we're now beginning to see the results of, and maybe not so appreciative of. So, it's you about know, diversity. I got something to chime in on. Um, years back, um, I was sitting having a glass of wine with my cousin's husband, who was the chief of staff at the Burlington Hospital, and he basically said. <clears throat> Jen tells me you're, you're, you're doing something with soil biology. Tell me about it. So basically I explained him, well, I, I, you know, I'm growing out, um, pro, um, I'm growing out amoebas, flagellates, saprophytic fungi, um, all of these healthy, beneficial aerobic organisms. And he goes, really? And how are you doing this? So I explained to him, I use just a plant based only, no manures, uh, greens and browns, and I make a compost, um, and then I encourage the, the, the organisms to, to multiply um, through, you know, moisture content and turning. <clears throat> so he said, you ever heard of a, um, you ever heard of a fecal transplant? And I was like, uh, no, what's that? And he explained to me what it is. And for the audience, it's basically taking uh, the manure from a human uh, through an operation and a, a relative and giving it to the other relative or planting it back into their system because what they found is a lot of these really aggressive treatments they kill off the microbiome um, and therefore the people can't digest food so in order to get them back off of the IV liquids and onto solid foods they have to perform this transplant and this transplant's been getting done more and more and more often now to the point where it's it's almost like uh, ridiculous and he goes, do you think this, this would work as a, as a vehicle to get a good biotic into the, to the gut? And I was like, well, yeah, of course it is. It's compost. It's all plant derived. It's the, the organisms are attached to humus the, or humates, some of the finest points of parts of, of the organic matter breakdown cycle. And so he got all excited and he goes, look, I, 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 you know, I want to do this and, and I'm going to talk to my team uh, when I get back to the hospital. Um, how would you do it? And I said, well, you know, as a contractor, I used to build clean rooms. So I would just build a clean room in my shop lab down in Connecticut, and I would keep it sterile and, and you know, perfect. It would be, again, just plant-based. And so off he went. <clears throat> a week or so went by, and uh, he didn't call. And I, so I called him, and I said, hey, what's going on? He goes, look, I need a little bit more time on this. And I didn't push him. I let him go. And I said, then that's fine. No problems. Just I'm around. Give me a call. Oh, two weeks later, he called me back and said, late night, I have horrible news. Um, unfortunately, the medical system can't figure out how to monetize this, and therefore, they're not interested in pursuing it. Right? Right? All we need to do is make healthy plant-based compost and stir it in a little bit of water once a day. There is your probiotic that is guaranteed to work. But again, it would be beneficial if you had a microscope and you could look at what you were consuming. Uh, not just blindly consuming something that potentially could have a pathogen. This is cool. I want to play with this. So um, having spent thousands of waking hours in community health centers and teaching people to breathe, to modify their nervous system tone, um, I love this. And the idea is because there's thousands of dollars spent on probiotics, okay? Maybe millions, I don't know. And a lot of them don't even get past the stomach acid. So no. I'm, I, uh, this makes sense. I'm it just... makes total sense. And, and again, you know, out here in LA, there was a fad not long ago where the stars were actually taking clay. Remember Tina, and I talked to you about this and mixing it into their Metamucil in the morning. Um, and I believe Tina's, Tina's balls may actually have the possibility of helping to deliver that stuff because the clay is more difficult to break down. Um, so a combination of this humate and the clay mixed together with these 
uh, ant or uh, aerobic organisms would would certainly jumpstart the, the system. And especially, because remember that, that you remember true. that your 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 gut is made up of three things: the stomach, the the up uh, the small intestine, and the large intestine. Well, it's known for fact that the large intestine really is your pharmacy. That's where all of the, the key things are present, whereas the stomach is more about getting your sugars and your you know, um, proteins out quickly into the system. <clears throat> so there may be a, a great way to do it suppositorily as well so that you are uh, surpassing the, the stomach acids that could potentially harm some of these uh, good guys. So It's interesting because that's so interesting. That is so fascinating. And it really fits with what I'm observing as to how they're operating. And also just to to kind of uh, echo what Pauline said earlier, I have never practiced uh, what I uh, aren't, what I'm not willing to take myself. And before Mm -hmm. I knew uh, the level that I know about the facultatives, I I drank my own, my own, um, serum that goes into making these balls and to, and I actually my whole family and some friends drank it as well and none of us got <laughs> sick or died <laughs> now that's citizen science right there love it <laughs> I'm sorry I'm just thinking, I'm sorry so I also have been playing with Christina's um clay balls in my own garden we've got container garden and it's very small but um, can, can we call them your sweaty balls? Yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just like, so I'm sorry, this, this interactions between plants and people and the, the parallels of stewardship and diversity, uh, you know, so it, are we going to drink it? Are we going to use enemas? I don't know, but I'm just kind of playing because Christina and I are playing with ways of collaborating because we live real near each other. So I'm like, okay, this, this is well, a very interesting thought. Thanks, Layton. <laughs> Layton, oh, Layton yeah, is also does. a co-collaborator. I, I, I think everyone who's willing to have these kinds of conversations, we are standing at the forefront of such marvelous, beautiful knowledge sharing that you can't help but be in collaboration. We are definitely there, people. So some another experiment that I was touching on uh, with Tina was I actually took one of these balls and I introduced it into an aquatic ecosystem. So it was a tropical fish uh, tank with a bunch of plants at the pet store. And my goal was to kind of see how the aquatic food web reacted with these balls because, you know, she's done some preliminary work on burying them in the, in the, in the edge of a creek and stuff like that. And, and then observing what happens. So I got a call that the little raft that I built uh, sunk because the clay got so heavy when it sucked up the water that the whole ball sank to the bottom of the aquarium and that they had to actually pull it out. And did I want it back? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. So I jumped in the car, ran down there. They gave it back to me and they put it in a bag. Well, I brought the bag home. And the next day I went to look at it and an entire web had created over the whole thing. It was completely encased in white ball. I have pictures. I, did I send you pictures of this, Tina? No. Okay, I, I wear it. Well, this <laughs> like, was, I like was mycelium? Oh, yes, exactly like mycelium. All right, but Tina and I have been talking that it isn't it isn't an aquatic fungi, we believe. I believe it's an aquatic yeast that's doing this. Um, similar to the pictures that she has with the little hairs wavering. They're not they're not fungal, although yeasts are in the fungal kingdom. They're not specifically a saprophyte or a mycorrhizae or one of those that we categorize as specifically fungi. Um, so interestingly enough. Um, I took some of them, I put it under the microscope and I looked at them and they looked to me, uh, as yeast. So that's why I'm going to kind of stick with that for now. And then interestingly enough, um, I took pictures of this. I sent it to my study group and we had some conversations about it. Unfortunately, I still haven't caught up with you on this, Tina, um, about, you know, some of the, some of the functions of, of this particular type of yeast. And interestingly enough, you know, I, while we were talking to these guys, they went back and I got the bag and all of the white was gone. All of the yeast was gone. There was no remnant, no trace whatsoever. And all that was left was a little bit of liquids on the bottom of the bag. So, of course, I took those liquids and put them right under the microscope. Oh, my God. 40, 50 nematodes, a slide. Um, flagellates, amoebas. I mean, just insane biology. So I am going to be replicating this uh, experiment again, um, and hopefully I'll have some more information on it within the next few weeks. 
Because I really think it's an amazing delivery system. I really do. I'm so excited. I can't wait to share with everybody. It's so good. Lady, <laughs> thank you for I'll being get you those guy. pictures. Okay. Thank you for meeting my beta, my beta, my beta guy. Absolutely. All about it. <laughs> so, oh, Christina, you, you, you have any other questions or? Uh, we can't end on balls. We can't end on my fuzzy balls. On your sweaty balls. <laughs> we have to say Weren't thank you. you. Wasn't I going to uh, uh, get to experience your sweaty balls? Yes, I guess. I, I guess. I guess. Yes, Peter. <laughs> it's not like gardens. I have some of Christina's balls on my shelf because oh. as, as a member of it's important. <laughs> totally find it. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. All right. Pauline. Sharon. Christy, who's not here anymore. Jordan. Peter, those who have dropped off. Layton. Those who are still here. <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys, for sharing the space and sharing your knowledge and your hearts, and your journeys. And Leighton, we need to bring the whole study group on. Yes, yeah, I will get on it for sure. I'm just trying to locate this picture. Uh, if I could send it to you um, via text, you might be able to post it up because it is pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was, the, the web was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. And unfortunately, I'm just not finding it. It's like it's bad hair. Here. It just has its own way. It's terrible. <laughs> and, and, and this was this was someone's fish tank in, in the LA area or where? Uh, yeah, I actually was working with a pet store to help them identify um, some pathogens. That, Did it have uh, any effect on the fish? Like what happened there? No, what? no. And that was that was something else that I was really interested in and in tracking down was how uh, how the the fish reacted because when the ball sank unfortunately it kind of more or less exploded and and um it basically clouded the tank so here's the oh, that's video terrible. Um, okay, no it, it, it didn't hurt the fish it was okay. it was fine okay. uh copy save more oh. all right so i'm on standby with my espn slash nbc olympics production uh copy. value <laughs> all right so so peter you want me to you want me to text it to you your your sure. phone yep, number yep yep all right peter it's it's a quick little video um so that i could give you some perspective of what what i was observing um and i think i i think i actually talked to you while i did this tina <laughs> so it's it's loading uh it's going and i'll tell you when it's gone so this is, a, a this is a let's see this is a half buried ball gone all right so i took i took a piece couple pieces of driftwood because i wanted it to look cute uh because this is a pet store i didn't want this you know weird thing floating around scaring the customers <laughs> so i made this cute little drift uh driftwood raft and i lined it with uh stainless steel fabric that is 47 micron which is just gorgeous stuff it's like film, it's like um, like clothes, like cloth. And that was to hold the, the clay in place so that it didn't like, you know, disintegrate into the tank. But unfortunately the raft sank when the ball became too heavy. So I'm gonna repeat it this time with a piece of foam so that I know no matter how heavy the, the ball actually gets, um, it will not sink to the bottom of the tank. But again, the, the good news is that the, the fish, the, the little frogs, the plants, everything was fine. It, they said there was absolutely zero uh, indication of any kind of stresses on the plant. And a matter of fact, it might have actually helped them in some ways. So the good news is that for whatever reason, that this is not going to harm uh, very sensitive aquatic uh, species or animals. And there it is, right? Yeah. Am I talking? That's yeah. crazy. Uh, you probably are, but we unfortunately. So you can narrate this, but yeah. but right, so, so basically, you're you're, you're saying when, when you pulled it out, it had no white, and the very next day it was covered with white. It was yeah. The, this is the next day. I pulled it out of the bag, and and I was just like, what the heck? Um, and of course, I threw it under the microscope, and I can send you pictures of the, the actual organisms that I captured, and they will pretty much indicate that it was. Um, you know, a, uh, a yeast.
Let me see if I can go back into the microscope. So, Lane, do you suspect that some of those organisms that you had in that liquid were coming from the aquarium? Because what I'm finding with these balls is that they're just an attractor for like all the life in the soil, that they're actually eating them and turning that and literally eating the clay as well and turning them into. So is, do you think all those organisms are coming from the aquarium itself and that they were? I, I do. I believe that the majority of them were uh, yeah. related to the aquatic life in the aquarium versus um, yeah, inherent. There you go. Right. Yep, yep. Right. But that's okay that's because they're eating it. They're attracted to it. So they're actually right. supporting life with your mineral matrix. It's kind of like that interspace between what's considered inert, although I think clays are full of life probably. But Peter, here's a couple more coming your way. This is, this is the actual view uh, that morning uh, under the microscope, a couple of the pictures. Not going to bore right. you with a ton so, of them. So, so while I'm waiting for that, uh, GR420 asked, what magnification microscope uh, would you recommend for the home and hobbyist to ID beneficial bacteria? I, I like the one that goes, um, some people call it ADX. I call it 800. So 200 through 800. Um, the sweet spot generally is the uh, 40X, or the yellow one, which is 400 power. This is what this these pictures are coming from. Um, I, I, I do use the 800 when I'm really trying to hone in on something, but most of the organisms that I'm studying or looking for are well within sight in the 400 range or 4X, 40X. So I have a specific microscope um, here that I love, and I'll tell you the name of it. And while Leighton is getting that... Uh... It may you know look what, like just, the moon. It's a swift. Um, and I'll take a picture of it and send it to you as well. And this this was uh, only, uh, I think it was $400. And the reason I picked this one was because it has the uh, eyepiece uh, or the headset that is comfortable and adjustable, unlike the uh, IMAX, which I really did not enjoy using in the past. So I'll send you two pictures of this. So side view and front view, and you can post it up. And, and then um, look at what, what are we seeing here? Those are the individual slides. Those are called a, uh, a view. And those are what we call a fruiting club, um, which is where the uh, actual spores would come out is the ball at the end. And then the little shaft is the body of the organism. <laughs> what what did she say she said it looks like the moon <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah no it totally does yeah can you see the little uh, guy smiling at you honey <laughs> so those those are just two shots of of the organisms uh, that were that created that web and and then to have the web completely melt away um in a couple of days after that is is really just kind of you know got my mind scratching so that's why i want to repeat the test yeah and all, that kind of because i've been thinking lately like why is it so they seem to be mutable like they're different in any like every environment is different they act differently they they i don't know there's some interesting remember things. remember the bird bath story this yes. is another one I, I put i put one of these uh in the bird bath to see how the birds would react to it and they just stopped coming and then a crow came and actually picked up uh, half the avocado shells that I used to attract uh, worms to my garden. He picked up the avocado shells and threw one in there. So I, I was like, well, that's weird. So I took it out. Next day I came back, he'd thrown three of them in there. So he really did not want that clay ball in the water. So I think it's a microorganism thing, not a, uh, not a uh, bird thing. <laughs> And so just quickly, this is, um, yeah, that's your scope. I, I, I have an AM scope. Uh, Can you, yeah, that, that head piece is the key. It's a, it's a precision German piece. It's not like the, the IMAX, I think is their name of the other one. It has the slides that go back and forth, which are so uncomfortable. This actually rotates out. So it's much more comfortable to fit your, your eye and your nose um, so that you're not like, you know, struggling to get to get to that sweet spot where it's comfortable to spend a lot of time behind the microscope 
And, and so this one's only 400 bucks and it yeah, serves three, your purposes. Oh God. Yeah. Three, 350 or under 400 for sure. Right. And just a, a wonderful piece of equipment. Um, easy to maintain, easy to use and uh, highly recommended. Someone asked G unit. Hold on. Sorry. Um, I Jamike, have you heard of enzyme inhibitors that cut off the food supply to the tumor? For example, CB 839 to cut off glutamine. Uh, and then G unit responds. I Jamike question. There is how do those enzyme inhibitors affect other cells? So I'll let Pauline answer. I, I'm just going to do the big picture. To me, we are in completely new era in terms of helping people heal with the diagnosis of cancer. So I think kind of like Jordan, kind of like Christy, I have been reluctant to care for people living with this diagnosis of cancer because I trained under an old model. It's like chemotherapy, toxic radiotherapy. And to me, cannabis is helping me bridge. So I started like with medical marijuana to help people with the symptoms of the cancer or the treatment. And there's a lot more people who really understand how to use this people, help people heal living with this diagnosis. But this, this question about the enzyme inhibitors, we are exploding the old ways we're looking at the cells and the metabolism. You know, some of them like sugar, some of them don't. This is why having the testing of what, what causes this. And that's why we change the, the things up every four to so whatever weeks, because the cells adapt. But to me, working at that level, if we go back to the cell danger response, cancer cells came from our bodies. And so they're just rogue. And so they're kind of like adolescents that just aren't communicating very well with other people. So if we go back to that cell danger response, the cancer cells are kind of, now this is metaphysical and I'm noticing the chat, there's a people who don't like the woo woo, but there's a, there's a basis to this, that a cancer cell is a cell that's alone. It's not communicating well with the other cells. It's off doing its own thing. And so creating environments to get them metabolically aligned, helping them communicate efficiently and not be greedy and gather the machines and not gather the oxygen, not gather the blood supply. So there's a lot to be said about promoting communication between the cancer cells and getting them to be good members of the community. So I don't know, Pauline, that there was a specific question about specific therapies in terms of enzymes. And, but no, I, I, you said that very eloquently. Dr. Sharon, and the only thing I would add is community is the key here. You know, just like we in our lives, you know, need community. It's in, in our shamanic circles, you know, the elders that have, the indigenous elders that I work with have said this COVID is, is our ally. And the same thing, and, and, it, and it is and it's in a way has brought us so close together. Even though we've all been separated, it's brought us close together in this way, even. And the same thing is happening with our cells and our body. And if we don't bridge that gap and we leave that cancer cell over here to just multiply and multiply and multiply, right? As it's being its, you know, its secular cell, then, you know, it's going to multiply and take over our whole system unless we can get it to start talking to the other cells. And like you said, I mean, every one of us has cancer in us. Not one of us doesn't have this cell in us. That's exactly. You know, I'm not special. You know. Oh, yeah, you are, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was just chosen to bridge, to help to bridge the gap. That's the only reason I got this, and I and I thank it every day. I go, you know, thanks for being here because you know I was wondering where my business was going. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Right? You take a wrecking ball and you try to find some humor in it. Right? That's necessary. You know, if you, if you sit there and think about your right. cancer as this, this entity that's taking over you, that's going to kill you because that's what your doctors told you. Then well, it will. guess what? It will. And, you know, and, and you probably will die around the same time. If he tells you you have three months to live, 
you know, by <laughs> that the, that third month, you know, you're you're probably going to be on your best one because that's your belief system. You're going to he tells you you're going to do it, you're going to do it. Well, I don't believe that that's true. And there is there is a tremendous amount of data coming out now about interstellar communication and and enzymes and um, how they are talking both with the exchange of uh, atoms, um, enzymes, peptides, aminos. So there's there's a lot more work to be done on that. But again, I think that Doc said it perfect. It's like, all right, how do you get this guy, this little cancer cell, to not act up and and get out of line? And I think that some of these therapies in the future will be, you know, enzyme related for sure. It's all about the molecule. Did that answer your question? <laughs> I, I, yeah, we, I think I, 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 yeah, it was, I, I took. Peter. Sharon's <laughs> monitoring the, the YouTube chat for us. Okay. She's, she's on top to go of there, it. But it's a deep, dark hole. I don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> can i mention play just because play is something i want to like just always do yes i think about. a thing to add to the conversation about <laughs> health i don't know because i have to pee and i might have to go soon but um, i just wanted to say that like balancing the sacred ha how about like this you're <laughs> when you need to pee is when we'll call it so oh, it's like the yeah. sand in the hourglass. Awesome. Your, 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 bla your bladder is the sand in the hourglass. <laughs> so y'all, yeah, I'll end it on play. And the play is a balance between the sacred and the irreverent. And if we lose our ability to play, that we lose our ability to um, the joy of living and we'll be lost. And so let's, let's find a way to play together and work together and have it be all the same thing. And um, Peter, thank you so much for yeah, aho, yes. aho, thank beautiful. You, Christy, thank you, Peter. Thank yeah, you. For all the people watching, that's when we're ended. I, for some reason, mm -hmm. people are like, you ended abruptly. Uh, so it's a wrap. <laughs> yeah, it is a wrap. And uh, with and that, I will. A poet just wants our attention. Yeah, I will kill the live stream and uh, we'll be back in a day or two with some topic and some people and I have no idea who or what or, but uh, <laughs> thank you everyone.